Second warning. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. This is the um, January 9th study session um, of the Littleton City Council. We have all council members present uh, with our city manager and sitting in our assistant deputy city attorney, assistant city attorney. Um, so I, there's no adjustments to the agenda. However, um, at the conclusion of the meeting, I've got three or four housekeeping items that we'll go through briefly, and then the city attorney and city manager. Um, I know there's a couple updates from them. Carol? I would like to make an addition to the agenda. Okay. What is that? It has to do with uh, filling lift vacancies. Okay. What specifically? With the 
uh, amendment to uh, that we did last council meeting. Oh, the motion you made. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That passed. Okay. Good. Four to three. started with um, we have a presentation on priority based budgeting and I just want to kind of um, let council know that this presentation is really designed to be a opportunity for us to kind of get our first taste of priority based budgeting this is truly I believe a management decision as to the budgeting process we obviously are policymakers and We'll review the budget and make policy based on that. Um, but part of why Mark wanted to do this is because as our workshop is coming up, we recognize that there's opportunities um, there that we're going to be discussing that will have direct effect on our budget. And so having some familiarity with what we'll be working through this year, budget-wise, getting to September, ultimately, um, well, I think help us make better decisions or at least we'll be informed that way. So the context really is to think about it in terms of our planning. So, um, Mark, you want to go ahead and get started? Thank you, Mayor. Actually, that was a pretty good introduction. I think uh, this might add to that. We had talked with the previous council about some of this, this concept in the past. And so we really are updating you on us kind of moving forward with this. As the mayor said here, this is been largely an administration decision here to kind of uh, proceed with this particular approach. Um, I think the piece that I, I want to add here is that um, as a council member, when you're looking at a municipal budget, it's typically a line item budget. So you get to see the actual line items department by department for things from professional services to pens and pencils. And so many times it's difficult for a council member to understand, you know, where is the budget? Is it truly oriented around your goals? And so I think, uh, based on my past experience, I've done things similar to this. This is a little bit of a different twist to, to my experience. I was more into performance-based budgeting. Uh, but I think, uh, I think the whole local government has been looking at issues like this, trying to find ways to measure the success, to be more efficient, to be more effective. And I think this is, quite honestly, this is just part of that process and fine-tuning that. So we've been working with the, with the uh, Priority-Based Budgeting Center here, back actually in Inglewood, and uh, they've done some impressive work. And so this is really to update you on the details about how, what this will look like. Because in the end, what you're going to see is a budget that's going to be layered on top of the line item budget, but it's going to be oriented around the programs and services. And then council at the policy level will decide what are the real priorities and make sure that budget is in alignment. So that's really the goal of this. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tiffany. She can do some inter more introductions and uh, off we go. Right, good evening, council. Um, tonight you're going to be seeing a presentation on um, priority-based budgeting. And as the mayor alluded to, it is kind of an overview of uh, the direction that staff is going to be going for the 2019 budget in particular. Um, we hope that we will be able to complete the full process in time for the 2019 budget. We'll certainly keep you up to date as to our progress. Um, I feel we have a pretty aggressive timeline um, compared to some of the other entities that I think have implemented this, but I think working with the Center for Priority-Based Budgeting, they've developed some really good tools um, to aid in the actual uh, process. Uh, from beginning to end. So I th I'm hoping that we'll be able to make it for the 2019 budget in full. And um, I think staff is looking forward to it. I know we in finance are. Um, there's nothing more exhilarating to me than taking a line item budget and allocating an <laughs> program-based budget. Um, cost accounting at its best. Um, to me, that is fun, if there's anything fun about accounting. Um, so I am thoroughly looking forward to it. Um, we've kind of been looking at this for a few years. I'm excited to get it started. Um, we have a local company who thankfully is local and will be kind of at our beck and call, if you will. Um, they may not realize that yet, but um, <laughs> I saw him not. Yeah. <laughs> that was exciting. <laughs> 
<laughs> so we're glad that they're local and um, can help us um, on a whim's notice. Um, so with that, I'd like to turn it over turn it over to Chris Fabian with Center for Priority Based Budgeting and Resource X. Um, if you want to go ahead and come up, Chris. And I have one question before you we get into his presentation. Then. Sure. So in the very first sentence, it said the increased demand for services. If you will, at some point, let us know what those increased demands are. Okay. Other than cost. Hi everyone, my Hi. name is Chris Fabian and I'm the founder of the Center for Priority Based Budgeting uh, and Resource X, our technology company that supports the work. Um, and I'm the creator of uh, Priority Based Budgeting as we know it in the government, even though there are many flavors of outcome based budgeting that exist in the world. Uh, Priority Based Budgeting came out of our work in Jefferson County. Uh, Colorado, please don't hold that against us, but uh, it was definitely a, a tough situation uh, as they had to go through what so many local governments did back in the early 2000s during the Great Recession. Um, the first uh, impetus, the, the motivation for creating priority-based budgeting goes back to some of the comments Mark made that with the tools we have, a line item budget, um, so often it's really difficult to be in your shoes to take that data and truly understand what your choices are, um, whether you're having to uh, balance the budget or whether you have abundant resources at your disposal to try to achieve great things for the community. Uh, so we are now at um, nearly 200 communities across the United States and into Canada. I'll get into that a little bit. Tonight's presentation, as Mark mentioned and, and as Tiffany mentioned, is to give you an idea of where this goes. So I have um, some initial slides uh, that are included in your handout um, to describe what communities accomplish, why they get into this in the first place, and some of the vision for where you can go with all of this. Um, and then a very little tiny part towards the end about mechanics, methodology, uh, not to go too far into the weeds, uh, but just to give you a general sense for uh, what you're in for. So with that, um, I did want to start with some discussion of why do communities do this priority-based budgeting. Uh, of the uh, implementers across the United States, um, when we first started our work, the reason why was because so many organizations were recovering or grappling with the impacts of the Great Recession. We wondered at the time, what happens when we get past the Great Recession? What happens when people balance their budgets? Uh, will they need priority-based budgeting anymore? Um, and what the rest of the presentation is about are all of the ways that communities use this um, when thankfully or gratefully you move on from a balanced budget to really understand how to fuel resources towards the results that, that really matter to you. Uh, of these communities across the United States, um, large cities like San Jose, Sacramento, California, uh, Edmonton, Alberta, Toledo, Ohio, um, small cities, Victor, Colorado, is anybody even in this room been to Victor, Colorado by any chance? I think I drove through it. Yeah, that's, that's even impressive. Uh, population of about 300 people, staff group of about five. They went through priority-based budgeting. As you can imagine, when you have very limited resources, um, all the more reason that you need to prioritize them, they're incredibly scarce. Uh, but most communities look a lot more like Littleton. As Mark mentioned, uh, we worked in Inglewood uh, nearby, Parker, Highlands Ranch. Um, and what's exciting about having more and more participation in the metro area is that one of the major outcomes of this work is that you will have a list of all the services you provide, how much they cost, how they contribute to your results, um, and therefore a ready-made uh, list of uh, services that you can put out there for partnership opportunities. So I'm going to describe that here in just a second as well. Can you ask a question? Yes. Um, and I, I um, heard a presentation on this several years ago, actually, at some state, some or other. But if I'm remembering correctly, you might actually, with one piece of work, address several um, issues. Is that correct? That with this uh, piece of work, priority-based budgeting, you can accomplish many objectives? With the, if you did X, you might actually address several different problems. Yeah, really good. You are right on target. That's the scoring process. Um, and I'm going to cover that uh, briefly towards the end in terms of the mechanics, but good memory. That's a, it's a nuance of the process that I'm impressed that you remember from years ago as well. 
so we'll get into it. But well, I thought if I, if I was right that that might help them also, but you're going to sneak up on it. I'll game sneak game up on it. So. Uh, <laughs> that's okay. Still the thunder. But, um, so one of the, the primary reasons that a community engages in priority-based budgeting is that it is a, a rational tool uh, to focus on, on stabilizing the scarce resources that you have. Um, this is an example of a community here very recently who used their evidence of priority-based budgeting um, as uh, a way to demonstrate to the bond rating agency, Standard & Poor's in their case, um, that they're being very accountable uh, with the resources that they have. Many of our communities use this in the bond rating exercise, and we'll be talking more and more about how to demonstrate that. Um, but for those who don't know, many of you might already know this, but during the Great Recession, many local governments were downgraded in terms of their overall credit ratings. Uh, and part of the reason for that is because so many local governments resorted to across the board uh, budget cuts to balance the budget. And while that succeeded for making the equation uh, balance out um, from the bond rating agency's perspective, it was absent any understanding of the consequences of the decisions that were being made to balance the budget. Whereas priority-based budgeting ensures that no matter what sort of uh, budget balancing exercise you're going through, that your resources are connected to results, the results that matter most to your community. So it's a responsible way to go through this um, uh, budget balancing exercise no matter what situation that you're in. Well, for many of our communities, luckily they graduate beyond just wanting to balance the budget, um, and the question will come before you, once we have prioritized all of our resources, can we continue to reallocate, even if we have a balanced budget, taking resources out of lower priority areas and making sure that they're invested in programs that have the utmost impact on results? Um, one of your neighbors, uh, Boulder, Colorado, is about eight years into their process now. Um, this is exactly what they're doing. And, and what you see on the screen will mean a lot more to you once staff uh, is done with their work. Um, but at the end of priority-based budgeting, every program you provide has a cost to it. Every program is scored against results, evaluation criteria, results like making the community safer, improving the economy, and so on. Uh, and those programs are ranked. So what you're looking at is the end product of some of our work. You will also have a spending array that looks like this, where quartile one and quartile two programs are those that have the greatest amount of influence on results, as differentiated from quartile three and quartile four. So what you're seeing in Boulder's case over the time lapse is that they have uh, systematically begun to mine away to the tune of about 1.8 million resources out of low priority areas in order to um, fuel the launch of new programs that have more to do with achieving results. That's, the, that's how success uh, looks like over time. And that's what you can begin to do with your work. Even when you have a balanced budget, you should always still be asking the question, are we doing the best that we can with the resources that we have? So once you begin to get good at that, um, looking at your current resources and your spending alignment, the question then that comes back in front of you uh, is, uh, what are we actually trying to achieve? Um, Mark mentioned the uh, retreat that's coming up in February, and this is a great question that'll be on the table as well, is towards what challenges of tomorrow are we actually trying to allocate resources? Um, communities like Kalamazoo, Michigan are doing some really interesting things. Uh, City of Kalamazoo is using their priority-based budgeting exercise to tackle ending generational poverty. Um, so what they're doing is making sure that all of their resources are, not all of them, but uh, to the greatest degree possible, are pointed towards that particular result. Uh, in Scott County, Minnesota, they're trying to tackle homelessness. Uh, so many of our communities are, are dealing with that. But the question that comes before you as elected officials is, if given the opportunity to free up large amounts of money and people within your organization, what would you do with that? What are the major challenges that you're trying to face for the future? Uh, what are you trying to achieve for this community five, ten years down the road? So it would be a fascinating component of your conversation uh, come February. Um, part and parcel with this, if any of you are familiar with Bloomberg's organization, What Works Cities, uh, this would be something, Mark, I, I am anxious to introduce you to their program. Um, for one reason, they have grant resources available. 
uh, for some of their work. Uh, and in what works cities, they've they've actually added a criteria to their certification process about reallocating resources away from programs that have less to do with results towards programs that have more to do with achieving results. So I'm just beating this drum about resource reallocation. This is part of the main point uh, driver of priority-based budgeting. What this looks like over time, um, and this is a snapshot from the software tools, you can see here uh, from one of our communities, again over three years, the migration of resources out of quartile four is 2015 spending, 2016, 2017, reducing by about four million or three uh, and a half or so million dollars. Quartile three doing the same thing in order to increase funding in quartile two and quartile one programs. Those are the programs, again, that can demonstrate relevance to what you're really trying to do. This is a community that has not been able to get a tax increase uh, supported by citizens. So what are you to do as a local government when you have no new additional resources coming into the equation? The best thing that we can do is figure out how to realign uh, the very resources that we have within. So is it actually removing funds from those quartiles or just shifting the program from, say, from three to two, say we prioritize it more, we're just moving where it is? It's not necessarily changing the bottom line? It, yeah, it's actually changing service levels um, with actual programs that you're providing in quartile four. So the programs, they can move if a program could demonstrate, hey, we used to not have an impact on results, okay. and now we do. Uh, but for the most part, in these programs, it's not a matter of just okay, reshuffling so the deck. Not of necessarily program. shuffling the programs. Just saying these aren't as effective, or we're, we're putting more money into them than we need to. Yep. We can still do it by putting more money into something else. Got it. So it's it's literally stopping certain programs, reducing service levels in other programs, in order to free up the people and the money to push towards other programs that you're going to start that are brand new, or to enhance current services and higher priority programs where you just need additional resources to continue to do a better job. That becomes part of your discussion as well. Question. So, is there any um, research connecting um, economic, improved economic condition of the city with this, right? So as you do X and Y, maybe your revenue grows 30%. Mm, that's very good. Um, one of a common result that most of our communities have is economic health or economic well-being, defined by job creation, business retention, and expansion, whatever the communities actually choose as their specific criteria. Um, at least one part of the answer to your question is that the local government becomes very good at understanding what is it that you're doing today that is actually having an impact on making the local economy better. And improving it. So just like Kalamazoo is focusing on ending generational poverty, your goal would be to take your resources and your programs and, and ask the question, what are we doing to, to improve local economic health? Um, are we actually moving the needle? Are more jobs uh, being created here or however you define it? Part of our complexity is where we're situated, what we do to improve might actually get somebody else the financial benefit mm -hmm. by the next door city benefit. Mm -hmm. I won't take time to elaborate on that, but I see how that could happen. Right? Sure. Because now, you know, this slummy area that's here is not spilling off into you know, visual impact. People don't want to go there. Um, some of the criteria, I believe, that comes into this when you're um, putting a one, two, and three, and four is also the measurable impact. Absolutely. So being able to identify how is it impacting us that we're giving value to, whether that's you know financial value or quality of life or something else. So is, is that a correct assumption? You're totally correct. Yep. The, the way that a program gets into quartile one versus quartile four is by proving itself uh, that it actually has a measurable impact on the results you're trying to achieve. And if you set up the criteria in the way that you'd like to see it play out, increased economic vitality, um, that is a, a so key result. So to Peggy's there. question, that would be something we look at and say, well, this is a good program to have. It is creating more benefit to another community or region. And and we, that may, for, look at that too. we could look at that and say, well, maybe we're, we're not going to invest in much in that program unless we can expand it in such a way that we can receive a benefit from it as well. 
jump through. So the question comes up, um, at some point you become very good at understanding how to reallocate from within uh, with your own resources. Then it begs the question, and I think this is a good segue, um, within your community, you are not alone. There are other entities uh, also who share similar goals of making the community safer, improving local economic health, health and well-being of citizens, and so on. Um, and this is pretty inspiring for us to see some of our communities reach this level of application of priority-based budgeting. Uh, just a couple of stories, but they're very simple. Washington County, Wisconsin, they're in the Milwaukee area. So imagine, just like uh, Washington County, you too will have a list of all of the services you provide, how much they cost, and their impacts on uh, community results overall. In Washington County, they take that list of programs and they've reached out to all the neighboring counties to simply say, here's what we're doing, are you doing the same thing? Is there a way that we can partner? Um, it's resulted in partnerships such as Emerged Public Health Department uh, and something as small as uh, maintaining uh, parks and medians across multiple counties and cities from within. So fostering this sort of government-to-government, public-public uh, partnership opportunity is one of the main outcomes of some of this work down the road. This is a, a fun story because it's a smaller community, Moffat County, um, here in Colorado, taking the exact same approach, but not just with the public sector. Uh, they invited their local hospital, uh, their school district, the community college, and went through this exact same exercise. It was very fascinating with their school district. We hoped we'd find 20 programs, maybe, uh, where they are offering similar things that they could partner on, uh, and they found over 220. Uh, so over $3 million there in Moffat County just partnering with the school district. Uh, one more simple example, larger city, city of Toledo, um, shifting away from the public sector uh, uh, partnership opportunities, they've done the same thing but with the private sector. So they reached out to their Chamber of Commerce, Chamber of Commerce making bids back to the city for ways that they can partner in some of their programs. Very simple example, Toledo offers a street sweeping program, currently costs them about $4 million. Via the Chamber, the private sector is making a bid to the city to do it for $2 million. They're coming up with a public-private partnership to provide street sweeping services overall. Uh, so some of the applications of this a little bit down the road uh, become quite fascinating. Again, I'm giving you a picture of way down the road just so you have an idea of, of what you're getting into. Um, we talked a little bit... So you go just ahead. made a statement. Um, and coming back, I think in the beginning, maybe it was Kyle asking, so priority-based budgeting primarily is designed to make us more f uh, use our funds more effectively first versus efficiently. So give me, can you talk about effective versus efficient? Great question. Um, so I would actually say the very first question, the fundamental question that you first grapple with is are you offering programs that are relevant? Relevant to what? relevant to the criteria that you set. Um, so we're asking the question, why are you here? Why do you provide services overall? Shouldn't we be doing it all? Exactly. So before we try to tackle a program and, and ask can we make it more efficient, let's first ask the question, are we sure we want to be in this business? Uh, and then once you are satisfied with the answer to that question, the next question becomes, is the program performing as well as we hope it, it could? That's back to the scoring of programs relative to the results and the constant measurement. Is it as effective as we hope? And then finally, um, the question of efficiency can be answered in a number of ways. Uh, one, down to just, uh, do we have the appropriate resource allocation to a program? Can we make it more efficient? Can it achieve its objectives for less resources? Or um, can we look for other partners as well? Do we need to be the main service provider? That's great. Cool. Uh, in, in, in terms of the question that you just asked, um, I wanted you all to know it's it's a topic that's on a lot of organizations' minds. What is the role of, of local government? Uh, we've been in touch with Deloitte because they have spent a lot of time focusing on the future uh, of local government and its role, and we really like they have a, a positive viewpoint, um, irrespective of your political persuasion, uh, finding a role, a positive role for local government in the future is something that we're all concerned with and interested in. Uh, on behalf of Deloitte, they have made a point that if you go back in time 50 years ago, so many of the services we got into uh, in local government, we did because nobody else was around to be able to provide that particular program. Um, we are the main service provider and we are concerned with safer society, healthier people, 
uh, great local economy. You fast forward to today, we're still concerned with the same results, but there are many other players, uh, players with whom uh, uh, we can share our services, uh, create partnerships, and find more efficient ways to get the job done. So that's exciting. Speaking of the future, um, I, I kind of wrap up on the why PVB with this section. Um, sometimes we are, we talk too much about priority-based budgeting within our own uh, organization or we spend a lot of time with city managers and elected officials uh, and the question comes up, well, aren't, aren't we doing good enough? Aren't, aren't we uh, accomplishing our mission overall? And in so many cases, the answer is absolutely 100% yes. Um, but when we dig deeper into the conversation and we hear about the crises um, and the challenges that many organizations are facing, whether it's dealing with the opioid epidemic um, or more on the positive side, dealing with what does an autonomous vehicle future look like for our um, civilization, the question back to you as elected officials is always, what does this community look like five years down the road? What are the 10 to 20 programs that you wish you could start to reshape your community if only you had the money to do it? Sometimes our only restriction on having those conversations is it's unrealistic because government just doesn't grow very fast or you grow at 3%. And so you don't spend a whole lot of time thinking about the top 10 new programs that you'd like to start to answer tomorrow's problems because you don't feel like you have the money to do it. And I'm here to tell you that one of the most exciting parts about priority-based budgeting is that it is an engine to at least give you the um, opportunity to say if we could reallocate our own resources, maybe we could tackle some of these issues. Uh, an organization we work closely with is Brookings, um, and Bruce Katz is uh, one of the authors of several books and he researches local government and trends, and they are infatuated with Pittsburgh. Uh, why? Because Pittsburgh has done this amazing job of collaborating with the private sector, the public sector, their universities, their nonprofits overall. Uh, in what Bruce is calling the new localism. With simple concept, it's just how well are you aware of what other entities are doing in your own community and how big is your potential to leverage these other entities uh, to partner with. Bruce has a book coming out. If you didn't get everything on your Christmas list, this is January 18th. Uh, the new localism um, is covering this very topic and Bruce presented at ICMA uh, just in San Antonio. Uh, we had a chance to catch up with him afterwards just sharing some of the um, virtues of our own work and the on-the-ground partnering that we're able to see. And I think the exciting part to us is um, why the future doesn't look like Pittsburgh, uh, why couldn't it look a lot more like Littleton and some of the things that you're doing. And I wanted to kind of end on that note before getting into a little bit of the mechanics here for just a second because it really is inspiring. When Tiffany talks about um, how uh, Exhilarating, I think was your term. Uh, you are to deal with program inventory, program accounting, and really trying to understand what these things cost. Um, it is it is true, and it's funny to talk about in terms of the way that you, that you described it, but, I, but if I were to put it in my own words, it's understanding that the budget, the data that you deal with, if framed in a different way, can unleash a whole lot of new conversations and uh, discussions of your future, and that's what priority-based budgeting is all about. Um, last section, uh, I know we're kind of close on time here, um, but I did want to spend just a little bit of time, if it's appropriate, Mark, just to talk a little bit about methodology. Um, so, didn't want to get too far into the weeds here. As you so, in priority-based budgeting, uh, we are trying to put together this data. What you see in the center, um, we're going to be working with staff to develop an inventory of programs. What is it that you do? I think that fundamentally will be a, a, an interesting list for you all to see. I know you know what this organization does. You absolutely do. You know the departments. You see it at work uh, in your daily lives. But it's a whole other ballgame when you see the list of the 100, 200, 300 plus services that are actually being provided. We'll call them programs throughout our process. So it's just introduction to the vocabulary. Um, in the exercise, uh, we will take your, we work with staff to take your line item budget uh, and exhilarate them uh, in this allocation of costs to programs. Uh, but truly, um, the steps of the, of the work, the mechanics that we'll be working on, is taking your entire line item budget, expenses, and the revenue side, and allocating them to the programs. So, um, as Mark was saying, right now in a line item budget, you have supplies and services, you have travel and training, you have pens and pencils, and now we'll know um, what component of those line items are associated with snow removal or business license inspections. 
uh, and the services that you provide. Go ahead, question. Are you, I can see that hard costs would be easy to apply, but what about the soft costs? I mean, how do you people? Yeah, so um, it's a methodology, and, <laughs> and the idea, this is kind of fascinating, um, what, is our, what is our most valuable resource? It's, it's time. Um, so it's an approximation of how much time you spend or a staff member spends supporting the various programs that they support. And once we can understand that, we can allocate and do the math uh, proportion of their overall personnel costs. So if Chris Fabian spends 35% of his time doing revenue analysis uh, and 40% of his time doing the budget process uh, and whatever the math equates to doing snow removal, I then take that um, percentage of time and allocate it to the programs as well. I'll get to your question in just one second. Just finish this point. Um, for all priority-based budgeting communities, what ends up happening? So nobody we work with has migrated to a time tracking system or anything like that. It would be too much effort in, not enough value out. It's still a budgeting exercise. It's plus or minus, do we know where we spend our time in general so that we have a good understanding of how much things cost? But uh, what is exciting is that it does place new emphasis on, do we know how much time we spend on, the, on these various programs overall? So in that spectrum of crazy precision following somebody around with a stopwatch and a time and motion study versus a total swag, you are gonna start migrating towards something reasonable but it's still a budgeting exercise. Okay. Is that helpful? Yeah. Sure. Question, sorry. Yeah, have you already been hired by the city? Uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, have we signed the contract? We have, yes. Because I should know that. I'm not <laughs> signing it. <laughs> 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 Sounds good. Sorry. Okay. When did that happen? Just recently, I think, yeah. uh, here in December. In the last couple of weeks. Yeah. Um, so the allocation of cost to programs will be another step that takes place. And then finally, uh, the scoring of programs, which is what you were bringing up relative to what we call results, these fundamental reasons for your being, um, will help us to understand how we prioritize programs. And this is the uh, process in a nutshell. Before you yeah. Programs. Yes. How are they defined? Because you could get very, very specific or... Broadly, you could say police services, or you could break up every single thing a police officer does. Totally true. Um, you, you want this process to add value uh, at the end. You want to drive discussions that you want to have. And for that reason, there are some thresholds as we work with staff um, where defining a program at a certain level that's so small will not add any value. It's, it's a discussion that you don't want to have. Uh, and conversely, defining programs that are very large you miss a lot of the conversations that you could have. So we have a sweet spot that we're looking for. However, there are always exceptions to the rule. Um, in Clark County, uh, Washington, they defined a program that, by our definition, was way too small. They had 0.2 FTE. That's 20% of one person's time going to a program called strategic planning. Uh, and when uh, we brought it up and said, why would you keep track of a program? It's so tiny. And they said, well, the truth is, um, council wants us to do a lot more strategic planning, and they are upset with our products that we bring back to them in terms of strategic plans, and we wanted to prove the point that it's because we only have 0.2 FTE inside this program. <laughs> uh, so it's a great example of how to use the data in order to drive a conversation that you want to have. Right. Interesting. Real quick, back to Carol's question. Are we under contract with you for a year, or is this a four-year program, or what, what are we... It's a, um, we have a one-year contract, okay. uh, so for any organization, um, at least from when I was in local government, you can only appropriate a budget uh, legally for a year. Um, so while with uh, over 90%, 97% of our organizations, we continue to work with them in the future, it's an option that will be on the table in the future for you. And what is your specific deliverable to the city? Uh, it's twofold. Um, one is services to help with the implementation. So we need to put these pieces together. So what you see up on the screen is, is really important here. Um, a program inventory, uh, the allocation of cost to those programs, the identification of results, the definition of results, this, and the scoring of programs. Is, that's the process that we're going to work through together. 
So we have the support services to help uh, the city of Littleton implement priority-based budgeting. And when is that due? Uh, we worked on a timeline this morning. Um, we are hoping to bring information to council um, definitely for the budget sessions in September. So we're going to actually start working. Uh, we had a meeting today, and we're going to schedule um, our initial kickoff meeting, hopefully with staff, um, in a couple of weeks um, so that we can start the inventory process. And then finally, the last part of the answer to your question is the tools. Um, so if you recall the chart that had the four quartiles and the migration of resources in a bar chart, um, there are software tools uh, that will help Tiffany and her team to load data um, and then analyze the information to actually recommend the new budget. And do you get your information by uh, analyzing staff members or how do you get your information? Um, the information comes from staff participating in the exercise. So staff will identify their program inventory. Mm -hmm. Staff will go through the allocation of costs to their programs and will load that into the tools. Go ahead, Mark. Chris, you might talk a little bit about how when we prioritize, the staff provides, the departments provide kind of an initial assessment, mm -hmm. uh, an initial kind of value, but there's a peer group that actually reviews all of that to kind of double check, to question, to make sure that the assumptions the staff is making in individual departments is consistent with others. Very true. Um, in the scoring part of the exercise, there are two components. This is great. This is like really good and, and uh, nuts and bolts question, but it's important that you understand the logic of the process. So departments will have their own program inventory, and they'll score them from their opinion based on the evaluation criteria, all of the results. And we teach them how to do that. Um, and we also encourage the departments, make the best case that you can that your programs have a connection to one or more result areas, just like you brought up, uh, Council Member, um, because they're trying to do the best that they can to express or communicate, that's all scoring is, how influential their programs are to your criteria. And is there a citizen input aspect to this? Um, there could be, uh, when it comes to the there results. There isn't right now. Um, to, to be determined. Uh, so for many communities, they embark on priority-based budgeting uh, in their first year, putting together the data, and in their second year, um, bring this out to citizens. In other communities, they start right away, longer process, but um, enga engaging citizens on results, result definitions. Uh, so there will be a host of, um, or a variety of ways that you can do this. So I'll be communicating to Mark. And yeah, I think it, just my own experience, it, um, it takes about two to three years, I think, for the organization, the staff itself, to be pretty comfortable with it. Uh, then taking it to the next level is kind of this open question, how far do you want to take it? So the, the citizen involvement is an interesting question. In fact, the last thing I was not even discussed some of that as well. So it's, uh, again, first couple of years, we just, the staff's got to get used to this and make sure we're proficient. Is that fair to say? Totally fair to say. Uh, and I, I agree for so many organizations, especially in their first year, you want to be confident in the data that you're putting together. It's the first time, talking about a cultural shift, I think we were discussing, um, to develop a program inventory, put a price tag on it, uh, feel good about the cost allocation of staff time, really understand the data, and then the, the more comfortable that you are, the more you can stand behind it when you invite citizens to have their input uh, on your information too. Um, to add on to that, so um, as I shared with you earlier, I went through a similar process in the private sector and it took us about three years. You know, truly that cultural shift where we really began to feel everyone in the organization spoke the same language, etc. So um, that sounds makes like sense. it's mine and makes sense to um, how this is going to unfold. And coming back as a follow-up to Carol's question on um, uh, what services you're providing this initial year and then the ongoing costs, I do see 30000 this year and 25000 in future years. Part of the future year is the I'm assuming the cost for the software tools and licenses, et cetera, right? True. So it's, it's so, in, if you decide to move uh, forward with us in the future, it's software in addition to um, like all of the level ups that you saw earlier. Uh, for instance, if you want to take your data and have a discussion with all neighboring cities and share your program inventories with Inglewood or the Chamber of Commerce 
um, or Arapaho County. Um, those are services that we provide because other priority-based budgeting communities are doing it. We want to make sure that you have access to all of that information, um, and we can lead you through that. So does, I just want to clarify a little bit further. We will have, um, is this also, or part of the scope also includes a management reporting tool that we can use in-house, or will we always have to reach out to you for that? Done the reporting capabilities throughout the tool. One of our fundamental objectives as a company is making this user friendly. You can extract the data. We'll show staff, super users, how to access this. Mark, sorry. Yeah, in fact, that, that's one of the reasons why I like this particular approach itself. He's providing tools that we as staff get to generate the reports. We become familiar. We're comfortable with it. We don't have to go to a consultant every time we have a question. We generate the information. Maybe just a couple of quick stories here, if I may. Sure. When I, the last city I was in, again, a little different variation, but for Public Works, I remember we identified like 115 different services that Public Works provided. And when I looked at the list, there was stuff on there I had no idea we were doing, to be honest. <laughs> and so when, when the staff then looked at it, they, they asked the same question, said, why are we doing this? And eventually, you know, that prioritization came up to the council, and they affirmed that. They said, we're questioning why we're doing some of this stuff. And it changes the, just the dynamic of the conversation between the staff and the council when you take it to this kind of level about what truly are your priorities and making sure that we are measuring that for success. So to me, that's why it's so exciting. So I reinforce the finance department's enthusiasm. <laughs> it, it, it really is kind of a, it really is a cultural change for an organization when they start having this level of conversation. It becomes an objective conversation, not a personal conversation about right. my department. Exactly. I think I what I what I think is very valuable from um, his company is the inventory that's already there. I think one of the biggest challenges that other cities have faced is defining the program, how small, how large, in the middle. And I think by working with so many organizations that he already has and some that are local specifically Inglewood and Parker, I think it's going to allow us to be able to pick some programs that we know we're using and that other cities are using as well. And so we don't have to try to think of all the programs um, that we're providing that we may miss or something. I think by having the core ones listed that other cities have, um, it allows us more time to focus on how to allocate our staff or our supplies or, or whatever line items we're using. So to me that is a very important piece because I know in the past a lot of cities have spent a wealth of time just on that portion. So having the inventory is very important I think um, to the whole process. It's true. Our direction is to try to make this easier and easier and easier on organizations to implement and that was one of our barriers early on. For the first number of communities, it was a conceptual exercise. It's very abstract to think through, well, what is a program? How small should we define it? How, what's too big? Um, and you'd have to come up with it on your own. Uh, at this point, we across the 180 communities or so, we have over 96,000 programs that we've come across, across all local governments across the United States. Pretty cool. Um, we published in December all the different holiday lighting uh, programs and how much they cost various communities and some up to four hundred thousand dollars that they spend on holiday lighting others down to one dollar because they get it all done by partnerships um, so that's really fascinating uh, we come across you will still have your unique programs I, I, what Tiffany said is, is so crucial it's going to help all of your departments get such a leg up in the process to understand what a program is and not spin their wheels and yet at the same time they're going to identify things that are totally unique to Littleton I guarantee it um, we were talking to staff earlier in Minnesota. We were just implementing in Duluth. They are the first state we've ever seen where the cities run the liquor stores and the pubs. Uh, so they're city-run operations in Beaumont, Alberta, Canada. They have Taco Tuesday celebrations on Tuesdays. In <laughs> South Jordan, Utah, they have the only city-run beauty pageant that we've seen. Uh, so you will learn, back to Mark's point, a lot about what takes place in the uniqueness of Littleton, which is fantastic, too. But the, don't over-customize. So that is um, a lesson learned from our part, too, that 
when you overly customize something, then you lose the sustainability of it and then some of the partnerships that you talked about too. So I think that's a very good point. Just a hit. Should I go through a handful of other slides or, or is there no, I think we're probably a third okay. time. This is the this is the methodology. We can go further in detail, but it's yeah. good. I guess I have to make a few comments if I can. Uh, Mark, I, I thank you for trying to, to do something different. I mean, we're at a point, not that we've doing, been doing things wrong, it's just that it's time to do something different. Um, I, I, I think if Kalamazoo can come up with an end poverty, <laughs> no, I, I doubt it'll happen. No, no. It won't happen any more than Denver's tenure to end poverty by Governor Hickenlooper ended poverty in 10 years. It's been 15 or more years. They spent millions of dollars unaccountable and we have a larger homeless plan. So I, I, I won't support any plans that are going to be grandiose like that. I think those are noble plans, but I, I think we need to spend our money on realistic plans. And that, to me, I, we can talk programs and all that good stuff, but if we're not going to be talking about police, fire, infrastructure, that kind of stuff, I don't care if they're called programs or what, but that, that's what we got to do. We have a library. we got to take care of those. Those are the things that I know you're struggling. How are we going to pay for these things? So I'm not looking for new stuff, that's for sure, necessarily. Because we have on our must-have list of things we have to support. Uh, I think when we talked about communities that are getting grants, I presume they're getting those federal grants or something like that. And it, I guess the federal, federal feds have lots of money or something like that. I don't know. That, I, that's another thing. I, I would like to see little to be responsible, not relying on grants. And, and we don't necessarily. I don't think we do. I, I would like to see Littleton helping, you know, to take care of the country, too, by not constantly pulling money for a grant and say, oh, we got all these grants and let's pat ourselves on the back. I, that's not what I want to do. I want to see ourselves sustainable somehow. Um, I, 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 you know, we, th these ideas, are, they sound so good to end homelessness and to end poverty, and let's spend lots of money on that. <clears throat> that is a little that, that we got other things that we got to take care of. Um, yeah, did I had anything else in here? I'm sort of on a podium right now, so I got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so, uh, so thank you for, for doing this. I, I look forward to this plan. I know a little bit about private based. Uh, I, I've also been through other you know decision making type things, and that's what this is a decision making thing. What, whether it be Joseph Deming or whether it be uh, Kepner Trigo, I've been through these things over the decades. <laughs> yes. So uh, this is another way, and uh, but it's another tool. So I, I, I look forward to uh, to you guys using it and making it work the best you can. Thank you. Appreciate that. Back to the mayor's comment, aligning this with your priorities coming out of the retreat, I think is a big, giant goal here so that we can measure the success of that. Great. Okay. So since Jerry mentioned we have a library, the library is not just a library. Just in time. We have a library building, but there are several programs in that building. And I have my thoughts about whether we need them all, but that's not... I mean, it's not just one person. It's identifying those and seeing, do we want these? Can we afford these? Should we modify any of these? So all those kinds of programs are become part of this. Well, I expect that Mark, through his directors, all of them, they're going to come with, up with some ideas that we're just going to think are very radical. Yeah. But if they, they have a plan to make it work, that, that's what they need to be clear on, and how can they make it work and sustainable. And that's what this is about. Chris and Mark, can I just add, um, you haven't showed what I thought was one of the best outcomes in this whole program, and that's the dashboard at the end. Oh, when yes. I said it's one of the best yeah. for the public. Yeah, we're dying to show it. Um, it's, it's all about transparency. It's where any citizen can get on their website, get into the program, and just start breaking down the budget, you can go keep going deeper and deeper and deeper into any line item, uh, any program, and then any line item within that. So I don't know if you have that real quick, you can just show them one example at least of that, because it's really a, a great tool. Sounds good. Uh, are we quite successful here? Uh, Way to go, Randy. Thanks. All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is looking That's why we keep you back there, okay? <laughs> Add in that I think this looks like a great tool.
tool, basically just a filter over the budget to, to show us how things are being, um, how funds are being used, if they're effective or not, and that could help us answer the questions like, hey, we're spending this much on a program that maybe not be, we're not getting that return on, so we can prioritize that. So I think this is a great way to use as a tool to help. And I think it's also important to keep in mind that this isn't a one-year fix. This is the beginning of, as we had a council member like to say, you know, turning the freighter around. I mean, it's, there's, we're going to find areas where we're doing things really well and other areas where we really need to do some work. And it, it can take years to make that happen because it is, you really don't want to do this cold water shock to some of the programs and some of the things that we have going on in the city. And I think, I think the idea of partnering that is a great idea. I think cities are going to have to look at that more and more as we all are struggling with um, fighting for revenues and the internet's taking taking over that way. But that stuff doesn't happen quickly either. So identifying those and then being, reaching, reaching out and creating those um, takes time. But I think having a, having a baseline to start from is good. This is um, because Eric Keck's not here. We can just go to Inglewood. <laughs> That's where all his data. We could have got a partner. <laughs> so Inglewood did a, the outcome of their work. They had very little in Quartel Four, but still over two million bucks. Um, Nineteen million in Quartel Three, and the vast majority as you see there in, in Quartel One and Quartel Two. Uh, what becomes pretty neat? We can break this down and see. Um, we distinguish throughout the exercise between programs offered directly to citizens, we call them community-oriented programs, and they get scored against community-oriented results, like a safer community, healthy economy, and so on. Um, but we can also take a look more internally within the organization and see the support uh, functions, what we call the, the governance programs overall. City manager's office, budget, finance, IT, risk, purchasing, legal, Wiggle in the back. <laughs> but, uh, and for every department, um, they get to take a look at their own programs, their own spending array, this is across the entire organization, as they're making recommendations back to Mark, back to Tiffany, and back to you all as council members uh, about how they're using their own resources. Um, every fund, if you're wondering if we're just using one or the other, um, it's everything across the organization, so we wanted to have a specific discussion about the general fund. We could just look at general fund spending, and as you see here, it's it's a different picture. Um, what does this indicate? It means that some of their other higher priority programs are coming from utilities uh, or other funds that they have overall. So when we're just focusing in on your scarce resources within the general fund, uh, we can narrow the picture down like so. Um, as Randy was discussing, if we wanted to dig into any of these, we can dig into the Quartel One program. So here's back to infrastructure, public safety, library. Um, so you can see these, these functions overall. And not surprising, you're gonna see things like water treatment, police patrol, engineering services, uh, and so on and so forth. Why do they end up in Quartel One? Because they demonstrate a high degree of influence on results. It's not that someone just puts them there and someone chooses to take a program and just put it in Quartel 4 because nobody would ever put a program in Quartel 4. Uh, that's the overall uh, net outcome of the work. What's an example of Quartel 4? Um, I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, Boulder, Colorado, first time we went through this, one of their Quartel 4 programs was offered in their recreation center um, and is a yoga program. Uh, so when they looked at the uh, data, um, one of their council members said, this can't be so. I know the people who use the yoga program and they absolutely love it. Uh, so <laughs> we dive into this a little bit and, and you can take a look at how it scored. And for their results, it had a low score for making the community safer. It had a low score for their transportation and infrastructure uh, result area. It was not mandated. Uh, it did not serve the majority of the population, so on and so forth. And, but the council member was still not satisfied um, with the outcome. Uh, people seem to love the program, so where's the disconnect? And any ideas in the room why people love the you know, program in Boulder? So it's Boulder? Free. It was free. <laughs> free. Mayor nailed it. Yep. So uh, it was free. That's why people loved it. 
Um, if you go back 50 years, kind of the Deloitte point, Boulder got into the yoga business back in a period of time because their citizens really wanted it and there was no other service provider for that particular program. So they started a city-run yoga program. No big deal. That's, it was a good decision at the time. You fast forward to today and there's Core Power Yoga and 24 Hour Fitness and CU has a yoga program and there's, they said they had more yoga studios than Starbucks uh, throughout Boulder. Um, and so the, the, the need for that program was no longer there and it didn't achieve results. So, what do you do with a program like that? Well, first they asked, are we serving an underprivileged portion of our community? Are, is this not the same as core power yoga? Is this yoga for people that otherwise couldn't afford it? And good due diligence, but the answer was no. Uh, that's, they were just regular people going to use the program for free. So the next question was, well, if we raised our rates even to get commensurate with the private sector, can we do that? Is that fair that we were not sort of undercutting our own businesses um, would you pay for that? And the user said, absolutely not. We would not pay for the service. The city facilities aren't that great. Uh, so, that was the, so that's a perfect example. Did they cut the program? No, but they formed a partnership with the private sector to say, we're going to, we as a city believe that it's wise to get out of the business of providing something that others are providing that has no relationship to our results any longer, and they can migrate out of that uh, service. So program. to clarify that. Core tiles aren't someone ranking them as the most important, or I love this most, or this is most beneficial. It's actually based on results. You're totally true. Okay. Uh, there will be a, an element here. This was going to get really wonky. Tiffany advised me correctly not to get into this, but uh, there are. <laughs> every program ends up with a final score, normalized to a scale of 0 to 100. 100 would be perfect. And we can see your top scoring programs are, by definition, Quartile 1, they're your highest scoring programs, as differentiated from Quartile 2, Quartile 3, and Quartile 4 are simply your lowest scoring programs overall. So it's not someone placing it into a quartile, it's an outcome of the scoring process. And are they true quartiles, the 25%? You know, the they're not. Um, we received some criticism on the name over the years, um, and we could call them just Group 1, okay. and Group 2, but uh, in the beginning we had envisioned that you have to make the, you have to draw the line somewhere, and why not just do top 25%? Um, but then we had so many cases where a borderline program, it scored the exact same, whether it's quartile one or quartile two, like grading a set of test scores on a curve. Uh, so we migrated more towards standard deviation, and some basic statistics of quartiles. That's the idea. Statistics. <laughs> Let's don't go there. We won't go there. You <laughs> we went too far. <laughs> oh, man. Well, I love the statistics. <laughs> I guess you <laughs> we'll dive a lot more deeply into the tools, but I, Randy, thanks for letting me play with that. Um, the analytics and the, the reporting that comes to departments so that they can start to look at their own data and report back and um, see the benefits of suggestions by uh, over 100 other communities. Um, that gets really exciting when you move beyond just implementing PBB to using the data. Is this something the communities do every single year and their priorities change every every single year? Or The idea is definitely to do it every year. Um, you don't have to. You could say, hey, we did it one year and um, we have a net uh, outcome of the exercise. The reason to do it every year is because you want to see it change. Right. You want to see resources being reallocated in a, in a way that is satisfactory to you and the direction you're going in your community. Right. Um, whereas if you just did it one year, one static uh, point in time, you wouldn't know if you're getting better, necessarily. Can, can, can you eventually save money? Uh, can you eventually, you know, you're moving resources around, but your, your budget's still your budget. Um, oh yeah. But, but can you eventually save some money? Oh yeah, I, I, I think by looking at the programs, um, decisions can be made, should we continue that program, can we? Well, sure, I mean, in the beginning, you, you could. Or you can see if there's redundancy, hey, these two right. programs are doing the same thing, why? Right. They, 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 Early on, I yeah. can see that. I, I think on. that we might we might see across departments that uh, maybe some uh, departments are doing similar programs, and can we combine those sure. maybe in, in some form and, and have some cost savings um, sure. for that? Or like the partnerships, he said, hey, you know, Inglewood and Littleton are doing the exact right, same thing. Exactly. If we both did it together, we could each save money. Yeah, no I don't know what that would be, but... Very common end result. Yeah. Right. I think in the Boulder Yoga program, I mean, that, that is literally, those staff members no longer work for Boulder. That is real cost savings sure. overall to the city. What they do with that next, they could choose to reinvest in other programs or in Strathcona County, Alberta. They 
have lowered taxes because that's the nature of their uh, society up there. That's what they're well, Our problem is. isn't yoga. Our problem is paying for streets. <laughs> and that's what we got to find money to pay for streets. And that's what we got to do. Right, and capital. Pawn shop, all run by the city. There we go. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it, I, I'm, in, I'm looking forward to seeing what kind of ideas you have. I agree. It's going to have to be very, very creative. <laughs>
Okay, our next item is um, a discussion of, regarding the authorities, boards, and commissions um, and the interview process. And I think we had mentioned um, at the last, I don't know, the last study session or council meeting that we were looking at doing a change in the way that we handle the interview process. It's just, it's, it's, a, it's an overwhelming three nights and it's challenging not only for council to deal with, but we also have staff here online with us and we also have, I think it's a, it's a lot to ask for the people that are applying. Um, and it's always a snowy, three, three snowy nights too. But to, you know, ask people to come out at nine o'clock for a 9.30 interview. Um, so we have, uh, new um, concept. It's not new, it's actually been done in a number of cities. It was recommended kind of in combination from Randy and from Steve that, where they've seen this done actually in a better format. So Mark, do you want to walk through it or I don't know if walk, going to walk through it. Oh, I'm going to walk through it here. I think uh, the staff communication just kind of uh, again emphasized what the mayor is sharing there. There's actually a draft policy that was attached there. If you've had an opportunity to read that kind of explains a little bit procedurally how this might play out. Um, I do have kind of a draft schedule about how this, this may work for you, but uh, at least for this year. The intent here is to try to, instead of all seven of you interviewing every single application, basically it's breaking up into smaller groups, and then we would work with you and the applicants, depending how you're assigned to these uh, subcommittees, to go ahead and interview these uh, specific boards and commissions, you bring up all those recommendations back to a study session for which you then you have some discussion about all that and then reach some consensus and then formalize that in the following meeting. So I'm just going to pass this out as just a kind of a rough outline here of, of a schedule. So if you did agree with this, uh, this particular policy here, then we would look to divide you up here in much smaller groups, twos. Uh, in essence here, but, uh, and then work with you uh, to get you the applications. And this all comes through the city clerk's office. So if you look at this, uh, I guess maybe I better wait for the outline. Do, do you want to, who do you want this distributed to? Just to the, the, the council. The council. Yeah, I'm sorry, I should have divided it up. We should probably give it to the citizens too. Sure, there's probably a few extras in there. I'll share mine with them if we end up not having Do I have to share with you? <laughs> no. I'll go share with somebody else. Okay, that was, this, this works. Priority. So we advertise. Um, we advertise for all of our boards and commissions here um, for the applications to be due at the end of this month, the end of January. And so you're seeing here applications are due to the city clerk by 5 p.m. on January 31st. Then, if you agree with this policy, then each council group would be uh, divided here into three groups. And then the clerk would work with you to try to find, uh, you know, basically some three-hour increments here to, to schedule all this stuff. We're trying to provide as much flexibility for you as council members and as well as the applicants. Yes, so maybe. could we maybe identify what we see as strengths, which is what I think you focused on, and also though weaknesses of the proposal and maybe strengths of what we currently are doing. There might be something in between or we, sure. might, we might like what we've got if we identify these things. And one quick step back before we do that. Can you give us a sense of how many applications you get in? About 45. Yeah. No. And then are all 45 interviewed, or is there like a... a yes, correct. We did not screen them as staff, so you interviewed them all. So the, the process, at least for the last couple of years that I'm aware of, um, all council members sat in a room like this, and then you went through each board and interviewed every single one of them over three nights, and you started basically, what, at 6.30 or 6 sometimes, and it would go till 9.30, 10 o'clock at night. Yep. Yes, Carol. I, I participated as an applicant in that process for the last two years, and it seemed like a, a really 
arduous way to do things. I, I've worked in corporate human resources at Honeywell for a number of years, and, and, and I wonder why we don't do something more like look at uh, applications and resumes first to screen rather than interviewing everyone. That, that um, it, it seems like a very... We, uh, we have, we do get all of that beforehand and I think it's been, the intention has been a courtesy um, that these folks are, are citizens and they're volunteering. And it's not courteous to drag them in here and have them interview when they really probably wouldn't make the cut. But just like an interview, I mean, or hiring somebody, what you see on paper is not necessarily what you get when you talk to the person. You might think someone's great on paper, but a corporation and, and it, and it can be just never a corporation. interview everybody. A corporation doesn't have to. I think we're dealing with citizens. Oh, no, we that's, that's right. <laughs> yes, we are. Yeah. So, so I think it is a courtesy. And, and, and they're and, volunteers. They're, yeah, not, they're still they're volunteers. Not yeah. Yeah. And some of what some people are bitter at putting things in writing, and then they're not so good at the job, and vice versa. Um, that's part of what I think comes out of the, the two aspects of the written application and the, the live interview. And I agree with Carol if we were a business and we were hiring someone, but the fact that we are trying to get volunteers, I, I think it would be a benefit to the community to make sure that we fully vet everyone. Uh, I mean, again, that could be relative if there were 200 applications, then obviously something's not going to, that's not going to work. And I think part of, part of what we're, what we're doing when we're placing our boards and commissions folks is not just what their resume looks like, but what is their relationship to the city and what is it, why do they want to do this and what's, it, why is it important? And it's always interesting to hear their um, stories of their how their relationship with the museum or with the library or you know why they've come to a place in their life where doing something like this is important and we would miss that so I think I do agree it was an arduous process but I think that um, if we can continue to do the interviews but make it less arduous by splitting it up and um, I think this accomplishes it both. It, one, it interviews, every, gives everyone that courtesy, yeah. but it's not, it's more efficient to have a few council members do it rather than have everyone do it at the same time. How many spots are we talking about? We don't know yet. The okay. applications will be, fin I think they're due yeah, by the 31st. No, how many open? No, how many opens? opens. Oh, I don't know. I don't have that number, but uh, Wendy will send something, though. Yeah. Yeah, it's probably an average of I guess in three aboard and uh, two and like boards, 50, between 20 15 and 20. I are we ready to make some observations? Yeah, does everybody understand the process? Are they, do oh, we so want to walk, finish walking through what that would? So uh, just to clarify, um, my understanding of the process is there's a group of just two council, so group A would have two council members only. And then group A would just interview board of adjustments or? Yeah, whatever would be designated. Probably a couple of boards is my guess here. And then the interviews, the idea is that the interviews would be done between February 7th and 16th, which gives you the opportunity to be more flexible with your schedule, with their schedules. Um, you could do something like, you could meet here for three hours and have them kind of cycle through, or you could meet here for an hour and then the next day or next week meet for two hours or whatever would work, whatever works with your schedules would work with their schedules, and Wendy will be would coordinate all that based on um, input from the groups of two as to what their availability is. So I know some of, the, of you guys have availability during um, maybe one day a week during the morning and then maybe there's better availability for some maybe on a Saturday. And so we could tweak it um, to, to fit with that because it's... We'll make the calendar a little more complex I think. But. 
For the yeah, clerk. For the clerk. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've, I've already heard. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll hear some more. Would there be any benefit to splitting the boards and commissions up um, time-wise, calendar-wise, say these three or four boards are January and these three or four boards are July, so it's not everything all at once. I know that. No, that's a good idea. <laughs> I just yeah, that code wouldn't allow that, would it? Well, so we've got code yeah, we've got, say, yeah, yeah, we've got sure it, it and then, yeah, and they all it's a okay. expiration and a, a start. If we wanted to start yeah, to stagger, we yeah, we actually talked about that to stagger because a lot of cities yeah. do, and it does make it a lot less onerous. But boy, it would be it would probably be <laughs> it'd probably be three to six years before we'd have it at that kind of a place. So yeah, we're kind of stuck with our system, I think, at this point. When you talked about the time frame, February seventh through the sixteenth, that spans two weeks. I don't know if I about yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, is that typically? No, you typically no. just do it in one shot, one week, three get it done. Three nights, three, three nights. nights over one week. They're just three nights in a row. That's historically what we've done. Six to ten. Yeah. So if we're dividing and conquering, can't we still actually get it done in that one week of interviews and then the following week is the study session? Because if we're dividing and conquering, maybe it's a space limitation, but I'm sure we can solve for that. It's we have three people in here or two council members here, two there, two Yeah, there. that's just um, that's just a window. Yeah. Well, that's a it, window it that you be guys, shorter if you want. Yeah. We can figure Say it out a council together. member has a vacation plan have to work around it but you've got that window there and then the intention is that you would need to make your recommendations to the clerk no later than the 21st which would give right. groups of council people time to deliberate the twos to deliberate and bring back their recommendation to Wendy because she's got prepared for the packet which we would then get on that Thursday for the study session on the 27th, at which point we would have our deliberation here, hear, hear from everyone, um, and then make our recommendations to what would come back to us at a regular meeting on March 6th on consent. That way the um, people can be notified and be ready to start their service in April. So, so I think Patrick and I, have, we're on the basket weaving committee selection. So, like, so, so we, we, but we can meet with them whatever Patrick and I coordinate with Wendy, whether right. yeah. it is. Um, and then really the hard decision comes down between uh, the, the committee members to say, hey, that, and that is the tough part, is, as, as we know, is that some good people just don't get appointed. And that's the tough part. So then this two-person committee comes back to the full council and, and says why we're selecting these. Folks. Correct. That's the discussion. Yeah. You are making a recommendation for these. Which is likely going to be rubber stamped, I presume. It, it, it should be. Are we? You no. Know? Well, no, I don't know. actually, the, the body will can, can decide what they want to do. The recommendation will come from the two. And but yet that doesn't eliminate anybody that that the two did not recommend. So if they, did, the if they didn't interview them, how are they going to de-recommend them? Well, exactly. Yeah. I mean, so I, that's why I said it's, it's almost a rubber stamp. It, it it puts the onus on the two people to select those basket weavers. That's all it is to it. I mean, that's just what it is. And let's just do it. Well, I like to make disagree. decisions. I disagree. Okay. I know it takes time to do what we've been doing. But I think it's only fair to have everybody on council see these people. Because if we get into what you're saying, the essential becomes a little stamp, that doesn't make sense to me. But one of the things that, that we've had happen, depending on the numbers and what they've asked for, sometimes people get their second or third pick. And they're damn good. Um, but if you do it this way, it seems to me you're going to leave out a dynamic like that. In fact, sometimes we've seen the potential in somebody to do something they didn't apply for based on what they said about themselves, and we didn't have enough positions um, for what they were um, wanting to, to do. So I, th I think this is one of the most important things that council can do 
to encourage citizen involvement by applying, even if they don't get appointed, and being engaged and hopefully pulling people in from as far away as you live, Carol, teasing. <laughs> we do know we, we've had difficulty, unfortunately, with Trailmark with people on boards and commissions because it's so far for them um, to you know, come in to meetings and so forth. But that doesn't mean they, they can't or some aren't interested. But I think it is, it makes sense to let people apply, pick up to three choices, and, and interview and see what they really have to offer. Some of the boards and commissions are more critical than others in terms of what happens in the city. Some are critical in ways that are, um, like the library board, I think, is critical in certain ways. You get people on there who somehow think we should allow censorship of books. We're in trouble, I think, but apart from that. But I think it's important that we all do this, even though it takes time. So I think it's an important and valid statement to make that choice number four on a board that had three openings may not get on a board, but that person may be the best person to be on the you know coloring book board. Mm -hmm. um, but they weren't interviewed by you and Carol and didn't get on that board. Would and this is probably more onerous on the applicants than would, rather than having choices, you basically apply for a board, and if you think you want to be on more than one board, you apply for three different boards, and you have three interviews? Yeah. At, at one time. Well, at one, well. Right. That's what we've done. That's, that's what, that's what we've done in the past, but if right. two people are looking at this specific board. And it, yeah, they don't have that other second other person, right. so that person would have to interview twice, twice. Right. Right. to alleviate that, which I don't know if that is all that efficient for them. Okay. I'm okay with the three nights. That's just something that you block out the calendar and you just do it. You know? Well, if, if we're giving ourselves the opportunity to spread this over two weeks, then essentially you could do three nights one week, three nights another week, and then maybe it's not no. as long no, as... No, 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 no. We want... Somebody slap for you. or I'm sure this has happened, that in the past, even though it's for those three nights, you may not have all of the council members there, but at least you have, you always have a majority. Well, in the past, yeah, them. I think there's only been one even that I'm that. aware of where we had a council member that was not there for two nights, and that council member was able to, while they were not able to ask questions, they were able to hear, because we don't televise it, so we did have that I think we call, I don't think it's our, I don't think we Skype, it's whatever our version of that is. So we did have that. So let me go back to this. Okay, I think that the core, there's a couple of core things here. One is, is it important to, and I'm going to go around the table and give me a yes if it's important to you that all council members interview all applicants. Karina. Yeah. Carol. Yes. Jerry. Yes, and the reason is, is because at the end, that's where we had... I just wanted to... Well, well I'm expanding. <laughs> <laughs> that's, I guess everybody a chance to chime in on that same person. Kyle. I'm not sure. No. Uh, yes, thank you. Okay. We have a majority on that. So what we'll do then is we will interview... Um, all of us will interview all of them. Totally uh, sorry. And... and <laughs> Um, I think that what I would suggest that we do is I would like to see Wendy um, I, mean, I would like to see us end it at 8 o'clock I don't think it's fair to ask people who have babies to put to bed and work the next day and all that to come and get down here and sit here for 10 minutes in an interview and I, so I would like to see it what can be done in that regard. And that means, because I know that there's more availability on council on Friday, often, in terms of work schedules, um, to perhaps even move one of those sessions to starting earlier, like 
2 or 3 o'clock Friday because a lot of the people we interview are not working and can come in. Okay. So That's maybe idea. we create a little bit of flexibility with that so that we can reduce that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. Ha having gone through it, can I just comment? Because yes. there is still, um, there were some valid comments and policy in here beyond the, the group section. There was a lot of other things here that really is improving the process. So now that we're saying, yes, we're going to do everyone, I still do, you know, please do continue to look at what is the best approach to the interview. And one of the challenges as being, being participating is, I think we get 10 minutes or 15 minutes, and you really don't get especially if people are interviewing for more than one thing, you don't have enough time to really understand that person. So I don't know what get balance in the applicants and the amount of time that we have, et cetera. Is 15 minutes really the right amount of time? Or, or how does that actual, the interview happen that it's effective? And you're not just asking the same question that you asked on the sheet, because you can read that. You may just, so there's, there's a, a an opportunity to improve the interview process, and it's not just about breaking it up into groups. Jerry, I, yeah, I think the, the time thing about 15 minutes is max. There are times though when they, if they're one or two boards, it does get stretched out a little bit. Having one person, usually the mayor, ask the questions is the way to do it. Generally, you know, somebody might have a sort for that particular board. They might have a question they want to ask. All of it. Uh, applicants for that fine arts board or something. Mm -hmm. I think it's great. To, it's good to be consistent. If you're going to ask one applicant for that board, you got you need to ask them all. But I think the the 10 to 15 minutes is adequate time. There's a couple things that I would suggest. One is that we that applicants um, select choice one, and if they would like, they can also select choice two. I would highly recommend we eliminate this third option because that really does drag it down and quite honestly what we keep hearing from the applicants is I thought I had to because our program that they go up and sign right. up yes. on forces it, it looks that so that would be very helpful the other thing is is that I think that we can make a lot better use of those 15 minutes that we interview there is um, there is some repetitiveness done in the questions from what these guys have already given us on our on the applications, and so I don't think that we. I think that we can have a more <coughs> dynamic and a better interview by not repeating what is on there. Yes. And I also don't think that. And what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to um, do you know a three minute speech. You know, <laughs> you mind me? Uh, um, that that just and that that does that's not necessary anymore. And I think that the other thing I would offer, and I I get that we want to be consistent with all of our questions, but I would sometimes that can be a challenge. Sometimes somebody Phil would do this. He would come up with a really good question on, for one of them, and we were all like, "That's good. You've got to keep asking that." I don't remember so, ever saying that. I'm, yeah, <laughs> but I think if we do have something like that, then we can add that in. I would, but 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 um, the I would like council. I would like Wendy to send council all of the questions that we have for these boards and commissions, and I would like council's input on better questions, better phraseology. They, I these questions, they do not. They just don't. I just don't think they get to what we want. So I want this council's personality in those questions and get that done, get those mushed out and I'll, you know, the we'll, rule will make it cohesive. Um, and that way I think, I think we'll have a better interview. Um, we can, those 15 minutes will be a more quality opportunity. So we, would, okay. so we would have written answers to certain things and oral questions. In yeah, they'll have their application and they fill all that out and then we'll read, you know, we get that beforehand yeah. so we well, can read and be prepared and then and we'll have our questions. Since some people maybe served on a board or commission sometime in the past or maybe are reapplying, we might want to clarify for them that this is a little different than we've done in the past. So be sure that you put 
your full answer, your written answer, what you want to say, because we will probably not be asking. Yeah, they're not going to have a chance to elaborate. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, Wendy can put that in instructions because she sends them in instructions when she locks them in on their time. I think 15 minutes flies by quick in an interview, and I would love to spend them out of time, but the fact we have 31 vacancies, even if we just had these 31 people, that's seven hours and 45 minutes. Right. Assuming, we get, assuming we get 50 applicants, that's 16 hours of interviewing. Right. Is there a way to, do we need to interview people that are currently on a board that are just reapplying for that same spot? Yes, we do. That we made that a, a decision that if, if they wanted to be reappointed, because it's every three years, and so it was incumbent upon, because council turns over every two years, so um, having them come back in and be reappointed by the current council was important. But if we get some real um, kernels in the written things, we get to read that fairly Right, but we're still, still scheduling 15-minute blocks. It doesn't change the schedule of the interviews. No, no, but it, but it does, it does influence what questions we would ask then. That would be the, the kind of creme de la creme on probably how we. Well, at least I do. I have a, I initially sort based on the written, and sometimes I've been totally surprised, and somebody goes to the top when they come in for the live in. Oh, I, I completely and agree. So, so, but you still, they complement, the, the two things work together. To right, I'm them. not disputing that. I'm just looking straight logistics. So I'm going to divide the way council way. in half, rather than twos, but go in halves. Turn our times down to, yeah. you know. Was, it isn't that bad. Early really. in. Well, well I mean for and me. we're saying 15 minutes, but we, we usually do 10. Oh, I think well, if we do it in 10, 10 and, and then we get a stick on schedule, though, because oh, we, and we do. And we do. Yeah. Yeah, we do. And then you have the no shows, and we move yeah, people. Yeah, we have the no shows. Let's do consider. Can yeah, we consider 10? Yeah. That's what we've done in the 10. past. Let's yeah. do 10. Because if we've got, and, and a lot of them really do um, quite, get quite detailed on their application, so we get some good information there. And I think we can, and we let them know, you have 10 minutes, so we have five questions for you, and so please be conscious of your answers. We want to get through these five questions, and then if there's time after, then we can kind of round table and thing. But that, it does work. No, that's good, but we're going to need more, more than between six and eight, three nights a week. Yeah, well, that's, we, I like your idea of Friday. Yeah. What? Go Friday. So is that a fourth day then? It could be. It will have to be because if you do two hours. I mean, well, we'll we have can, once we get the applications in, can we look at what a schedule potentially looks like? Oh, and yeah, Wendy, Wendy will do all Absolutely. that. Absolutely. And then we can say, wow, we've got record submissions this year. We have 100 people. Wow. Whatever conversation we're having now when we get 100 people, we'll throw it out, you know, goes out the window. So um, I don't know, I'm, I'm getting to, I don't know that we're going to be able to solve, should it be three days, four days, five days? Okay, let's see what, what comes in, especially if there's 30. Um, and one of the things that you laid out here was one of the things we're trying to solve for is this intimidation factor. Well, if you come into a room full of, one, full of people, and that can be intimidating, two, then get the message, you got 10 minutes and you're going to get five questions. That is intimidating. So... I don't know that we're solving no for that. I mean, if that was one of the goals here, I don't think we're... <laughs> people for being on a board. <laughs> okay, sorry. No, I understand what you're saying. System. That, is, that is how it has to happen. Then I think we have to recognize, recognize that it's more, more casual. I don't think it's as intimidating. It's not that bad. No, but I'm saying that we have to recognize we may not be solving for it. Snowflakes need not apply. I mean, if you got to man up and do it. Well, what's this man? I say man. I say man. You say you have a man. So, well, what we'll know a lot more when we when the application deadline is closed and when um, when you get an idea of what and 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 I would be supportive to Pat's comment of saying, you know, depending on what we get in, you know, uh, two felt too small. Um, it probably doesn't. It doesn't have to be seven. 
Um, so I would be okay with you know half the council or five, and we rotate, and so not one person is spending hours and hours and hours. So if there's a math in between that those parameters, I'd be open to that. I think we decided. Only city council, or does do you participate in this board? No, only city council. Yeah, and yeah, there's Wendy's here as a schedule. Schedule. Right. 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 Um, yeah. Well, let's, as, the, yeah. as we talk, let, um, let's see how many applications we get. Let's let Wendy, as the clerk, kind of figure out what a tentative schedule is. If we have way too many, I could set it up like speed dating, if you like. Yeah. <laughs> do you know what that's about? Speed dating? No, I do not. Well, watch <laughs> Alex. I'm really <laughs> I'm, I'm have, way beyond that. <laughs> okay. We have had, I'm trying to remember this now, sometimes people apply for something. And the way they answer the questions, it indicates they have no idea what mm -hmm. the Water Commission does. Well, the Riverfront so, Authority was yeah, Exactly, that was a classic. So, I mean, it would seem that potentially, if that is apparent, and I'm not sure who would decide, that they just don't get interviewed. And the application, that's what I was to say, is there a way to, I, I don't necessarily like this idea, but a way to whittle down the interviews if there's a way to say, this, if we vote, Unanimously, that this person doesn't need to be interviewed. They're not going to. They're not going to get it. Or each council member gets to select two or three people they want to see for that board, and that way would also kind of do the same thing. Is hey, you know, this person appeared. This person did not appear on any. Just on the um, applications, and so no council member wanted to interview this person. I don't. I'm not. And like I said, it's not. But and again, it's, I think we're making a mountain out of a molehill. Yeah. Yeah, I think we wait and we see how many come in, and then we we know what we're dealing with at that point, and when you can yeah. figure things Two out. Two nights, three nights, four nights. She needs to come back to us. She can. Karina. Um, two comments. So the first, um, not a um, uh, interview or a selection process, but a screening process that helps to if if someone can whether this could be like American Idol. <laughs> no, but uh, do, do, do you understand? Do you understand what the planning board does? Do you understand that it's a commitment for two hours? Do you still want to be considered for this position? So, if there is a misunderstanding, or I have no idea what a board of adjustments does, um, then at least you could say, "Well, no, we're going to take this person off a board of adjustments because that person has decided through that screening process. Once they learn a little bit more, that they're like, "Oh no, that that's not what I thought it was. I'm not interested." So that might be a solution to consider. And then second. So the, should we still write a policy, though? I, I think that's good. I that, okay. So I still think we should write a policy. Yeah, I think let's let's try to figure out how what this it plays is. out. Yeah. And then I would yeah. like to reflect that in a policy. Yes, you, yes. I think that's really important. Yeah, okay. So. Okay, we've talked this to death. But is the, there is no current policy? No. No. Okay. No. Um, the one maybe reacting to that comment there, I think... Um, Wendy actually does a pretty good job of trying to make sure that these people understand what they're getting into, at yeah. least when we set up the interviews. But I'll reinforce that with her, make sure she kind of follows through. So well, well, no, we don't want a misunderstanding, obviously, somebody coming right. to an interview. And one of the questions that, that one of the standard questions <coughs> is, you understand that this board meets on this night at this regularity, and you are fine with that, because they've kind of indicated that on the document, that we, I think hearing it, is good, so we double check that. And, and quite honestly, except for boards and commissions that are oddly named, like the Riverfront Authority, everybody thought it was, I want to work on this stuff with the river. <laughs> um, they, they have a pretty good idea. I think Board of Adjustments is, and Board of Appeals can be a little bit. Well, they, they meet like once a year. That's true, that's the other. Okay, so, good on that. More to come. Um, a couple quick things I wanted to mention to council. Some housekeeping. Um, we also have C. Do you want to do C? Oh, first? I'm sorry. C. Carol. Yes. Um, when we had the last council meeting, we voted on an amendment to uh, 7B uh, about lift meetings, and, and that was... It, and, and, I, of course, am new, but I don't understand what happened to that amendment. It looks like we're not doing it. The amendment was to, um, and it passed, 4-3, uh, was to uh, require that um, 
council get a recommendation from the lift board as to the exact number of vacancies? And as I understand, um, that hasn't happened, that because the lift board isn't meeting, and I, I don't understand how the lift board can determine the exact number of vacancies if the board isn't meeting. So I'll respond. At the last lift meeting, uh, that was brought up by one of the board members. It was put to the city attorney and the city clerk to look at those numbers and come back. And after uh, the motion amendment at our last meeting, the attorney did, and, and they went through each person since the beginning of that board and said these are the three vacancies that are open and then the two terms that are ending in 2018. So we have gotten that. The, but, but what the amendment said, and, and I don't believe that we've done anything to change the amendment, no, was no. that the lift board, the lift board, would determine the exact number of vacancies, not that the city attorney would, or that the clerk would, or a representative of the lift board would, but the board would, all of the members together, determine that. And the reason I think that's important is, as I understand, it's not clear who has what term and when it expires. And so it would require the, the board to get together and figure that out. Well, when we talked to the attorney at that meeting, he said the board could make a recommendation at that time, but it's up to city council to decide. And the board determined that they would let the city attorney and the city clerk go through that, and they have done so and have... Has the board person. met, though, to do the that? The board has not met since then, and there's no quorum. There are not enough people yeah, on the board. I, I, as I recall, Wendy was going to go through the she calendar. She, she had to go back years, actually, she started, yeah. to, to figure out terms. From the 1980s. Right. And that's right. what from the beginning. <clears throat> right. Because there was mention of up to four. I mean, I, we knew of three, and then with the fourth term ending, and going through that, there was the fifth term that ended in 2018. That wasn't listed, so that is. Now, there, there is, a, as I understand, it is in April, though, right? There, there is. That's, a, yes, they ended there in April. There is a quorum that is available to meet. There is not. But what is a quorum? Four. 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 And so there's there's, four. there are three members on the lift board currently. There's Carol Brzezik mm -hmm. and um, just a minute. Jason Henderson and Kevin Seidler. He is no longer on the lift board. According to the law, he is. He submitted a letter of resignation. No, we're not. He did. He did? Uh, here it is. Okay, so I believe we have, who do we have here? Um, Jason? Yep. And we have, Karina's gone. Nicholas? Nope. He resigned. He resigned. Okay. And Kevin? Yep. And Carol. Yep. So that's Jason, Kevin. How about Justin? Justin's been gone for years. Okay. And Kyle, and you're still on it. I'm on as the legal advice from the attorney to be able to be the signer. I'm not. But you haven't resigned. Correct. So you're still on it. And I am unavailable to meet. So let me let me ask a question. What is, is the concern? What, what is, so yeah. if the city clerk the city clerk has all of the records, I mean she's the one that has access to all of the records. So if not the city clerk that can do this, I mean why why would it be another body? I mean the city clerk has the official records of all this better than anybody else. So it's not up to the lift board to set their own terms. Well, the thing is, we have an amendment that we passed that said the lift board, and, and this is me trying to understand how the process works. So we passed an amendment, and it's not being followed. And so does that mean that when we pass an amendment that I think it, is it doesn't? Well, it's not. How is it? Jerry. Sure. I'll let you chime in here. I think what, we, we did pass the amendment. I can't remember specific language. Yeah. Part of what we talked about that night, and we all have I thought it was at that night, was that you and I are going to expedite uh, interviews so we can get someone appointed. I would still like to see whether they have a quorum or not. I think the lift needs to meet. They need to get together to find out. 
are they, whatever, three it is? It? Is that what we determine? Three. Those three need to get together and just determine, are they solid? Is they, are they staying there? And then so that Wendy can move forward. Yes. So I would like to see them meet well, whether so they form or not. Why can't they meet? They can't meet. I've spoke with Nick and Kevin because their terms run through March. Mm -hmm. And when I explained the process that you guys were going through, okay. uh, Nicholas said he would resign now to reset that clock to... So we didn't have. He's one of the ones when he determined. He's one of the term one that ended. It ends in March. Right. Uh, when I spoke to Kevin, Kevin said he was thinking about it, and I have not heard from him since. So Bottom line is, you and I have got to get these apps eventually, and it was yeah, in January. Yeah, well, they closed on the eighth. Yeah. So, I guess I don't understand what the concern is, Carol. I think that that the the intent of the amendment that, that to get that information, we that information's been gotten. So, so the, 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 my intent when I made the amendment is that the information would come from the members of the lift board, and that's pretty clearly in the amendment. It, it doesn't say that the other people can decide. A recommendation from the lift board, from the lift board. Would, would you like Wendy to send out the list? To, of the terms of each term to each member? No, I don't want to hear it from Wendy. I want to no, hear no, it no, no, to get from the board to see if they are agree with the timing of that. I, I would like the board to meet and determine the exact number of vacancies, which is what the amendment says. Or it doesn't say the board would meet. Can we have a, get okay. a legal opinion on this, if not tonight? Yeah, right. I, I, that's yes. what I was going to suggest. Well, we have a legal opinion. Hang on a sec. Hang on a sec. I, I haven't finished. So what I would like to get the legal, because we, we did make a motion and it passed. Mm -hmm. can, can we find out, are we indeed following it? And if not, why? Yeah. That works for me. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Thank you. So I do have a question. If the board meets, but they only have two people, they can't meet. They can't make a decision. They can meet. They just can't make a decision. Right. Well, but that means they can't decide how many they have either. So. Well, that's not really a decision. Decision. That that's determined. That's gathering information. So that's what my so point is. If you want the information, where are they going to gather it from? They, they get it from the themselves. themselves. Where would they? Oh. Where would no. they get that information? They would have to go back to the records of years ago that they would ask right. Wendy for. Mm -hmm. So Wendy, we would be, uh, the board or the board members would be asking Wendy for that information and then they no. would... Karina, no. correct me if I'm wrong, at the last lift meeting, the board left that in the hands of the attorney and the clerk yes. to sort out. Yes, yes. And they so have sorted that out and that's, what, that's have. what the board determined at that meeting. What I would like to see then is for the attorney to determine if an amendment needs to be followed or not. That's what well, she's I think that's we'll, what we'll get a legal opinion on whether the amendment um, has been followed, what what would be... Can I just clarify the question? Mm -hmm. are, are we asking in particular if this one, this, this motion, one. this amendment, amended motion is being followed? Not in general, if it's correct. Right, this specific, no. this specific, this specific amended motion. Okay. Not if it okay. needs to be, but if it is. If it, if it, it is, is, and if it yes. is. If not, why not? Or if not, let's get on doing it. <laughs> oh, yeah, what does it take to make well, it well? I think we need a legal opinion as yeah, to what, exactly. what that would look like because we don't have a, essentially we don't have it, a It, it says a recommendation yeah. from the lift board. I understand. So we'll have the attorney take a look at that. And, and meanwhile, you and I got to jump on our thing. We will. Yeah. We've got Wendy's putting it together. So it just closed on the eighth. Okay. Um, good on all that. Okay. Um, okay. So just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, going forward, we because of the work we do on the first the first readings, which we've talked about. Well, the more challenging ones they come in, we work them through a study session before they end up. In, yeah. in that room. Um, for those that are a little less challenging, we've got our little city attorney city manager update in here, which we got like the easement information and stuff like that. So given that we are, I think, preparing ourselves well for First Amendments, we would recommend and will tend to. Um, As prioritizing to, agenda. Yes. Um, we don't need move them back into the consent agenda item because first reading, first reading is on the agenda, really for the 
the the only reason is to set the second reading and, and to put folks on notice the public hearing. And that's what it does, yeah. set the second okay. reading in the public hearing. So <clears throat> putting those back on, because they were getting pulled off consent because people wanted more information on them, and we are providing ourselves a great deal more information on those. So move those back up to consent. And we can always pull one. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, you've proven that. Um, <laughs> so then the other thing that I'm doing, and I think you'll see it on here, is putting time on the topics that we're discussing and meeting when I meet with Mark on the agendas, we kind of have an evaluation of how long we think they'll be. Um, I think that keeping think, trying to keep things within that time limit is just respectful of everybody's time and, and people that come. Um, oh, and the other thing I've asked staff to do, and they are doing it, and they are, it, it may not be perfect yet, but they because it's a real it's a real shift in their process. But that is that for our study sessions, anything that we will have presented, we will have in our packet. In the past, we have not had that, and we've come in and there's been long powerpoints or there's been presentations, and we that's the first time we're seeing it. So I've asked staff to please um, make sure that for just as you do, as they do for regular meetings, that we have that in our study session packet so that we are prepared um, and we aren't seeing things for the first time in a study session because it does give us an opportunity to have some questions and come with some, some stuff. So I think it's a better meeting. Yeah, well, well, tonight I asked Steph at some point to let us know what these extra demands are. So, that, you know, I, I asked that tonight. Not for an answer tonight. That is something that I would hopefully will come back, by the way. Time demands for Tiffany? From the priority based budget. Well, we're, we're, yeah. for tip, uh, with the first sentence, it says uh, because of oh, additional demands. Yes. So that's, that's something I want to make sure. I want to make that's, sure. But about that, that that's too. a good example because when I read that, because I had things in advance. Okay. So, Perfect. Um, if I can go home now. Bye. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. Okay, so a couple of things. One is just a little, I wanted to, we're going to be meeting with the South Suburban Parks and Rec um, Board of Directors for breakfast on the 20-something. It's probably say it's 7th, is that a Thursday? Yeah, it's a Thursday, we're meeting at the museum. It was the only one we, we all the others we were able to schedule on Fridays. But um, So one of the things that... 25th. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I want to bring up with them and, and have them kind of think about, talk about, years ago we had a liaison to the South Suburban Board and we also had a liaison to the Littleton Public Schools. So areas where we had a district relationship, where we had district partnership, except we, we didn't do it with, well for fire, we have our fire partner meeting, for urban drainage and flood control, the mayor goes to their meetings. So for our districts, we, but we kind of got away from someone with the South Suburban and we got away with someone for the school district. So what, what I want to bring back is an opportunity for, their, for that relationship to kind of come back, but in a little bit of a different form. And the format would be more one where we would designate one to two council members. I would suggest we designate two so that there's a backup. Um, and then at least one staff member, because there's always one staff member who's already working on something with South Suburban, typically in public works. And then South Suburban would do the same thing. They would designate um, their one and a backup and then a staff. And then that group would make a decision as to whether they wanted to be, I would say no more than bi-monthly would probably be fine every other month unless there was something coming up. But what that allows is that allows there to be an ongoing communication because we meet with the board. Typically, we have one study session with them when we're doing some sort of um, looking over a master plan or when we're doing South Platte um, Park work. Other than that, we'll have a breakfast with them. But obviously, we work with those guys every single day. We've got stuff going on. And so I think... Um, Having that ongoing touching base, bringing back information, taking information to them, 
will we'll strengthen the relationship. We've had some things where, you know, things are kind of going along and it's going like this, and then it mm -hmm. takes so much more work to get back to here. Um, and this group, what, whoever that would consist of, they would kind of design their own schedule and, and where they would meet. Probably, you know, I just you know, meet for lunch or something like that. Just kind of keep those lines of communication and relationship going. Um, so that I wanted to talk about at the breakfast that we're going to have with them, but I wanted to share that with you guys first to see if you felt that was something that you'd be interested in um, having part of our relationship with them. And uh, what it starts to look like, we can hash out, but... Well, I, I think bringing up South Suburban and Littleton Public Schools, when I think of who should we have a very strong relationship with, it's South Suburban and Littleton Public Schools. We know both of those things are huge assets um, to our community, so I do think we should have a relationship. How that unfolds, you know, we can determine that, but I would definitely support that. Absolutely. Okay. I'm surprised we didn't have it, actually. Yeah, I have too. Yeah. Well, and, and like I said, we had, um, but then over time, the council people that were doing that went off council, and we just, I don't know, for some reason it didn't get reappointed. Um, but I think we should also think about it for the public, for Littleton Public Schools. And we just met with them. I think we're scheduled to meet with them again in September. Um, but what we can do is let's talk to South Suburban, see what that starts to look like, and then maybe we can formulate a template for that and reach out to the schools and kind of even get it started that way without having to have a meeting. So everybody's good on that. Sure. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, my last thing, sorry, Mark, um, but this stuff is, <laughs> yeah, I guess, you know, yeah. but this stuff is timely and important. So, I wanted to give you guys an update regarding Columbine Square. Um, we all know what happened over there. Um, I think we may have all received an email from a citizen regarding concerns about the condition of that area and what's actually happening and what's not happening. And when I got that email, I yeah, just really... Because we are being recorded, it probably is good to say what happened over there. Oh, uh, well, there was a fire and the fire department is investigating. They believe that it was probably um, a transient fire. It was during a period of time where we had had some cold weather and um, so the fire was put out. One of the, I think there's a total of 10 buildings, so one of them was damaged. There's another one that did sustain some damage. Um, it wasn't as severe. And so we're doing the fire investigation at this point. Um, and then upon the conclusion of that, the, be the developer will, the property owner has permitting in process, which is part of why this is important. Um, I reached out to the citizen who, who sent the email and I suggested that I, I think a better way to approach things that are challenging in our community where we have people affected, where we have someone who's a property owner, where we have city who has a process, that a better way to work with everybody on situations like this is to work together and to open up lines of communication so that there is a dialogue of honest information as opposed to um, people not getting information and creating information or not getting it in a timely fashion and becoming um, upset by that. So to keep, to keep the temper of the situation, which is already challenging because everybody, everybody's tired of Columbine Square being a eyesore, um, having the problems that it has over there, um, including the developer who, or the property owner um, agent who I've spoken to, and they are equally, equally challenged by some of the things that have gone on. So what I did was I suggested to this particular citizen that we put together a four to five citizens um, task force type of thing where 
they would, that group would help with um, meeting with the city. Um, at this point, it, Pat and I, we had a meeting today with um, one citizen, Pat, myself, Mark, Jocelyn, and our mediator. So we organized that meeting. The mediator was involved because he has been spending a lot of time in the Columbine neighborhoods dealing with concerns from those neighbors. So he had a very good uh, background on that. Pat, of course, has also talked to a number of neighbors there. And it was a very, very, very good meeting, and it was very productive. And the outcome of that meeting is that we all agreed that it was important for there to be a, um, a strong communication effort um, so that everybody understood what was going on and, and a timeline applied to that also, because it's to say, yeah, we're going to get to it, is no longer acceptable. <laughs> so the next steps will be that there will be some additional names gathered um, and that have been assigned to people at that meeting to gather some of the names of the citizens who might be interested in working on the committee. And we're looking, you know, for people who want to sit at the table and have, you know, a productive conversation and, and help us to disseminate that information to their peers. Um, we're actually going to create what Mark referred to as a kind of a charter for the committee because we actually see this as possibly being something that can be used in other situations where we have challenging development and redevelopment. And the charter will also be a guiding document so when you are having a meeting you can go, if it starts to veer away, we can go back to that document and understand this is why we're here, this is what we believe our scope is. We then are also, and this is in not in really particular order, um, going to create a timeline, and this will be coming from staff, a timeline of city processes for this, for what this de developer is having to go through, what the property owner is having to go through, what, what is the city process for demolition, what, how long should that take, what are the hoops that have to be jumped through, um, which will give us all a better idea. That, you know, knowledge is power, so knowing that is will help, and, and particularly, well, for everybody, and the citizens also, neighbors also. Um, and then information from the developer. We uh, will be reaching out to the developer, wanting to know where are you in this process? What have you done? What are you waiting for? Um, and... I think having that information will be valuable because it, the developer really is not not doing anything. I have spoken to him a couple of times regarding the situation, and they are they do they are doing things, but a lot of what they're doing ends up getting stuck in another place because they have to get permits from the state in order to bring it back to us to be able to get a permit to do demolition. The fire has set that all back. So, and those have all been in process, and there's also you know you got to do it tap a sewer line and cap a sewer line and all of this other stuff that's going on and that's all been happening. The other thing would then be to get um, continuous and accurate information from the fire department as to what's going on with that. And what's the investigation? When's it over? What was the result? What is the required cleanup? Etc. Et so that we have information from the department who is in charge. And then we are going to develop. But what is it they're investigating? I mean, we know why there was a fire. So what are they investigating? They don't know. They have to prove it. There's a suspicion that it was um, that, but they have to have the. So they still have part so of. So they, they determined that it was homeless guys after all. Then what? I mean, then we're done. Then we're done. Then the investigation. But well, you know, why we even waste time on such a thing? I mean, you find bed mattresses, you find all this other stuff. It's well, they need it. Well, I'm sure that it's it's part of the, it's probably a legality to do it, and the insurance would need to have some sort of final. But the insurance do the investigation. Why are we doing the investigation? Because it's part of our job. It's part of the job, part of it's state law, too. So, you know, there's there's obligations there, and there's some concerns that we have internally. We just want to play out to make sure that we understand completely what happened. Yes, I'm, 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 are you, can I chime in now? Uh, no, I have one more on that. Um, <laughs> So the other part of that would be a communication process. And so that would be something where the, we, the communication department will create um, a window. 
what we kind of talked about is put something on the website, on the front page of the website, Columbine information or Columbine updates, something to that effect. People can go there, click on that, and all of this information will be there. The process that's going through, what's the timeline look like, what was the fire report, what is the, you know, where are, where are we at on the checklist? And that way everybody will have, everybody will know what everybody knows at the same time. And so I think that that is, that is the best that we can do. I think it's more than we have done. I think that's what the, the community not only deserves, but should expect. And I think that's what they want. Um, and I think that in my, my speaking with the developer, he would be very, it's not the developer, it's the agent for the owner, um, that he would like to have that information shared also because he, they, they have, they are working into this, they're working through this process. So that's where we are with that. We will, I will definitely keep you updated on, on this group and moving forward, but I think it's um, moving forward in a positive way and working with working together um, at least to share information. Okay, cool. so Jerry and then Kyle. Yeah, so uh, related to this fire and all this stuff, Mark, mm -hmm. so has that property owner, and I'm not talking to property manager, I know the property manager wants to do stuff, is motivated, <coughs> but I'm not too sure the owners are motivated. Has the property owner ever been fined for anything? Have we ever found a violation over there? Or is it just looks like heck, the neighbors hate it, and there's no violations? Well, I'm not aware of any fines the city's imposed, at least in recent time here. I think uh, the, the level of frustration the mayor is expressing here on the part of the community, we've been hearing about this pretty strong for, boy, a couple of years. I think it's in part while Ryan Thompson, our city mediator, has been involved to try to have a direct connection between the neighborhood and the owner. And I think what you see is a result of some of that action on their part, the fencing, which you know I realize is a little problematic at times, or the security that at times kind of circulates around there to verify you know, it's tight. But you know, I think um, we're trying to find a way for us to encourage the owner and a future developer, you know, to communicate with the city because we, I think we're all frustrated at this point. We want something done here. Now, I think the, the other piece that we all recognize is at some point, you know, if something is not uh, per our code, then they will have to perform. And quite honestly, an example of this is the burnt structure. So they have been notified they've got five days to clean this up. And so they're working through that process now. The wrinkle, is, is possible asbestos and the state concern about what may be in that debris pile. Mm -hmm. So we're having to work through that. Uh, but the, we've had a fair amount of conversation internally making sure that, you know, if there are code violations that we are pursuing those. I, I want to do it aggressively. Like we, we have let the property owner off the hook for, it seems to me, for years and years and years. And it's at the detriment of the, the neighborhood. And I, we need to turn it up. I don't, I don't know what you're hearing over there, Patrick. Well, you know, it, I'm obviously coming in uh, late to this, but absolutely, I, I love your approach. That I think uh, I didn't even think about the penalties uh, that there. You know, we talked about setting some guidelines, and I know we want to work with the uh, uh, developer in, in, in good faith and know that they're going to, you know, work with the neighborhood and that type of thing. But it has been way too long, and, and I think people are starting to boil over with, uh, with frustration. Well, and there's other properties around the city that where owners or credit unions or teachers unions and they're out of state and they own property here and their desire to do something has been really low. And it, it's time for this one to step it up. Right, I agree. Yeah, if I may add, I think as staff internally we've been talking about the internal processes that our code allows us to pursue. In fact, we've been talking about the city attorney's office recently about that. And uh, I believe the code lives in the building code. If I'm... Yes. So we, we're, we're trying to review that and understand really what is our uh, authority, our ability to pursue that. Well, one thing that was brought up when we had our meeting today is that um, 
apparently, I think it was Jefferson County, when the Safeway went dark off of Mineral and Platt. Is it wasn't Platt? Um, right. Yeah, when it went dark, Jefferson County said, take it down. And they had to go down there and demo it. And so, we don't do that. So maybe that's something we should look at. When something goes goes dark like that, um, we have a timeline or we have a window where that needs to be demoed so that this type of thing doesn't happen. Now this would be, be going in after. The one thing I will say about the code stuff is that I know that the that there have, they have been called on certain things, that there's been some a situation here or whatever. There's been a number of things and that they've had a property manager that then gets, takes care of it. So if they are, if they've done something, they get told you need to get this fixed the same way that if somebody, you know, has a weeds in their yard, they get told you need to take them down in X amount of days, and if you don't, we'll do it and we'll charge you. So I know that that has gone on and that they have been quick to respond. But all that being said, we're sick of it. It needs yeah, to go away. Exactly. We know it's a problem. This fire was an example. The, pro the irony of it is that they literally were two days away from getting their paperwork from the state on the paper on the state approving, giving that paperwork would have said they're clean to do the demo, and we would have issued the demo permit apparently within less than a week. Um, now the fire happened. So what has to happen is that state permit for the asbestos, that process starts over. Fortunately, only for that building that was damaged by the fire. So the other buildings that are out there, that state permit that has already been approved and is coming to us to go for the demo, um, that's okay. So they can, once that's finish through the process, which it should be very quickly, then they could start work on that and get that done. I do know that they have, there was a the problem with the sewer thing and that's been taken care of. They are continuing the process for the, to get this fire thing taken care of. It could take a little bit longer, but that it's all being done. So right now, you know, pounding our drums to tell them to do this is kind of a waste of our energy because they are doing it. They've also committed, um, they do have the money there, the money is in the bank to take care of everything that needs to be done, so it's not, there's not a financial situation either. Um, they are within very, they had a meeting today regarding the developer that they <coughs> choose for this project. They have been very meticulous in looking at specific developers that they want a developer that has a strong reputation, that has a strong commitment to a aggressive and a um, robust community outreach. Um, they recognize the challenges that they have with this particular piece of property, and so that has been a huge issue for them. They have found um, finding a developer who is willing to say, all right, yes, that is a huge part of our process, because as we know, some of them aren't that way. They are in final negotiations with this developer over one, apparently, one issue that they feel that they will have no problem getting through. Once that's done, they sign the contract, they have their developer. They've got their property manager, their developer, their permits are on their way. Um, we get them the demo permit, they start taking things down. The fence will have to stay up until other things start to happen. but. That's kind of the status right now today. Um, it's not a whole lot, whole lot different than what we heard a year ago. It's a whole lot different yeah, we, than what we heard no, a year ago. When they came to council about a year ago, they wanted to do stuff and they put up a fence. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I guess I'm I'm to the point now where I'm I'm, I'm I'm a nice guy, but once you get pissed off, you know, it's, it's like, don't piss me off. And I'm pissed off, and I'm, I'm willing to bring up removing urban renewal and just going after this owner and for legal to do whatever they need to do to get some action out of this owner. I'm tired of So, you know, what this is opening up, first of all, it's not just about that property. What we're talking about here is if we don't like that... Um, 
our codes are not strong enough to enforce timelines around how long you can keep a fence around the building or how long, you know, what kind of security do we want around an abandoned building. So the first onus is on us to make sure we are very clear what these types, what the code says and that we as a community are good with it, whether it happens at that property or it can happen, there's a lot of other properties <laughs> that it can happen in the city where, where that kind of we could be subject to that kind of city, right? There's other areas that are getting old and deteriorated and probably have asbestos. Um, so this, again, this could happen again. By the developer just coming in and developing it does, and us not doing anything on the code site doesn't mean this isn't going to happen again. So I, I, we have ownership and responsibility to know our codes, um, fines, impacts, etc and stay on top of them, not create exceptions for this person or that person. We have to be very strict on that. And the first part is knowing what they say. I'm so, not looking for exceptions. I'm looking for enforcement. It, exactly. Well, I'm hearing that we're not even, maybe we're, Maybe we're not even sure what all the things that do apply, um, but maybe that's just me hearing it that way. So I want, I want to be educated on what is our code enforcement in situations like this. Um, how do we and do we enforce it? Because at times there are laws out there that may not be enforced. We may take a, a stronger approach to Jerry's point. The second responsibility that we have here is communication. So to what Debbie has shared with us or what Ryan has done in mediation, that might be one or two or three or even ten people that they've asked a question, they've gotten an answer, but there's probably a hundred other people that have the same question. So this is all important and relevant information that if we can communicate it out in a bigger way, I think it helps inform, educate, we do know what is happening and what isn't happening, what we can control, what we can't control, so that we can focus our citizens' energy and our energy on the things we can. And that is, that's exactly what this group is doing. That is why we have the communication processes on here. And the deadline is January 23rd. We will have, at our next meeting of this group, we will have a communication process, which I said to Mark, once we see what that process is, the different layers, the different um, medias that we'll be using to share this information, disseminate it, get it out, um, it, we need to be able to pull the trigger and get it started the next day. The sooner the better, the longer we don't share the information, oh, worse, the yeah. worse it gets. So. So, but yeah, the communication is the biggest issue. Yeah. And I think we do to dispel some of the myths and disinformation that's out there about it is really important. But where do we draw the line on, you know, you said you put something on the city's homepage about this one. I'm I mean, what's it, like Jerry said in Greenstone, was it to have other citizens say, well, we don't like this shopping center over here. Why can't we get something mm -hmm. to shame them on the city website? I don't, I mean. Well, this isn't shaming. This is about sharing. Well, yeah, yeah, I know. I can, something. We do have a project list that's on the right, city right, website. Right. So anything that's up there so people can go and see what's going on. I think that this is a particular in interest, partly because the fire has created a fear um, and I think that there's an overwhelming concern throughout the entire metropolitan area of what we're seeing in terms of our homeless and what we're seeing in terms of um, some of the concerns around the drug use and those types of things. And, you know, that that is definitely not something that the community wants to start to see happen. So. That and the fact that the Columbine Square, it's just, it's been years and it's, and it's the longer that it goes without there being an opportunity for there to be a share of information, the worse things get. Um, some of the things that have been said about this situation on some of the social media out there has been incredibly damaging and it has been incredibly false. And so, in order to create a better way for this community to react and to relate to what's happening, um, we should just deal in a level of truth. And that is just 
transparent information from everybody involved. It's not opinion, it's not going to be judgmental stuff. It's timeline, permanence, check, check, these types of things. Karina. So, um, I don't, there's information we can put out there now. We don't have to wait for January 23rd. I mean, you already have a process for public work. So when there's road improvements going on or things like that, you're, you already have an outline of sorts or process of sorts that you're putting out for other projects that are going on. So you can, I would, I would like for you to consider adapting some of the things you already are doing on a more regular basis be, beyond just, um, you know, the, the press release that went out or an update. Absolutely. That, and, um, you know, some things that I have um, worked with in different organizations and even my children's school, um, it's just a frequently asked questions document. So Kelly's probably, her phone's ringing off the hook, Ryan's phone is ringing off the hook. They get together at the end of the day or at the end of the week, what are the questions you got? I got this, all right, let's put them together and let's put something out at the end of this week. But this week, all the frequently asked questions, here they are, here are our answers, and it goes out. So there are some things that are just low-hanging fruit that let's just start doing them now. Well, and I appreciate that. And, and, or can we start doing them now? Yeah. There's, there's, an ask. Ask. there's layers of complication to that because I've talked to Kelly about that. And part of the problem is, is that in order to to use citizen questions, we need the citizen's permission to use their question. Otherwise, it's just this random question that doesn't have a validity to it. And so that becomes somewhat challenging. And they've gone through this process before um, with the rumor control that we did at one point. And so it just runs into a lot of challenges. Talk to, we talked to Kelly about this last week. and. Um, made sense. We're not not going to do anything. Right now there is a um, the citizen that was with us in this group and Ryan are and meeting with Mark um, Barons to start getting some good information out on next door. Um, everybody is everybody is going into action on this now. So it does take a while to gather this info, put it in a concise place way so that it can be shared and um, understood. Because some of it's just like developer talk. So, if, if I may, admit, let me add to that. You know, I think um, from my perspective, one of the things I, I have to kind of measure against is all the other priorities that are being asked us to do here on a daily basis. <laughs> we want everything we want to know, Mark. So, you know, we, we and I certainly understand the sense of urgency here because there's a, I think we're all frustrated with this property and we want action. So how, how I can mobilize the resource, quite honestly, is an internal conversation that we're having now. And there's still a lot of issues here that we're not talking through that need to be settled here for us to clearly communicate and to put systems in place so that the information is accurate. Mm -hmm. So I can't do it immediately. So that's the piece that we're, we're working through is trying to figure out how quickly can we do it. The meeting we're having on the 23rd is just an opportunity for us to get back together and kind of reaffirm where we're at. If there's low-hanging fruit that we can pursue immediately, sure, we're absolutely going to do that. So that's kind of the challenge with a lot of this property. Let me just talk a little bit about the codes from my perspective, get a little deeper understanding here. Um, I have not personally read the code myself. I know the reference back to the building code. I, have, I was the chief building official for the city of Grand Junction and had to deal with this thing many years ago. So my experience with what I'm assuming is the same reference it's clumsy. It is not necessarily the most effective to pursue for immediate action of, of abatement of dangerous buildings. Mm -hmm. It's a legal process. Now, I will say before the arrival of our current city attorney, I did have a conversation with the acting city attorney, Ken Fellman, about other cities and their processes. And quite honestly, the city of Inglewood has something that's much more aggressive. And so he had done a little preliminary work on that, and then along comes, of course, Steve Kemp. So this is an issue that we would like to, you know, uh, resurrect here with Steve when he gets back from vacation about what it is we could do to be more effective. I would agree that this won't be the last problem we have. Yeah. And the whole conversation started with a series of homes that we had throughout the, the area that had become run down and were concerned that they were going to become a real serious problem. And in one case, I can think of it, it was. 
So I think there it is an opportunity for us to go back, and we will, in my opinion, probably have to update that to allow us to be a little more aggressive when we want to, yeah. when it's needed. So that's just my personal opinion, but the city attorney's office is the one who's really going to have to help us with that. Yeah, this goes back to the code work that we need to do. Yeah. And so, okay, I, I just wanted to share that because it's a timely thing. We'll continue updates on that. Um, Mark, you have a couple of updates. And, and, <laughs> if, if you get some people from your district that want to you know, talk a little bit more about that, feel free to send them over to me, but I prefer Mark, whatever. I'm good if somebody That's wants to go. Especially if they're in my district. Yeah, okay. yeah, I just, just a couple of quick updates. You know, uh, you've probably, if you've been looking at your tentative calendar, we've had this cancer trust for firefighters on the periodically, and this actually got approved for the 2018 budget here with the previous council, but it was an opportunity for us to look at a different way to kind of manage these claims that come from firefighters who've been exposed to you know, dangerous chemicals and the like, cancer specifically. So there is this trust that's been set up where they would take the liability, they, they would take the, the problem here. The question that has popped up, of course, is that as we look to negotiate uh, possibly something with South Metro, what happens if we jump into this and then a year later South Metro is then you know, providing the service? So it, it does look like we've resolved some of these issues, at least informally. I'm trying to get something in writing. This is a long way to say that it's on the calendar for next week, but if we get this in writing and confirmation of what we've been hearing, then it'll stay there. If not, then I'm likely to postpone it once again. I think when you finally get to see the staff communication, you will see that this is financially to the city's benefit, even for one year. But we've got to resolve this issue of what happens if South Metro is to somehow step into the picture. So that's kind of a heads up. All right. The second piece that I've got here is I just want to give you kind of a, a little bit more of an update on where we're at with the fire negotiation here with South Metro. We've had a couple of meetings here with um, Chief Baker and some of his staff trying to work through some of the detail. So the schedule that you're likely to see um, is a draft MOU roughly about the 1st of March. Memorandum. Memorandum of Understanding, thank you, sorry. And so this is the same approach that South Metro took with our two fire partners. The purpose of an MOU is to kind of lay out generally how we're going to approach this issue and come to agreement to that. So that would be the first opportunity for the council to kind of see what this structure could look like. Um, of course, the staff is going to do a fair amount of financial analysis as it relates to this thing. If the council approves the MOU, then the next step will be a much more formal intergovernmental agreement, IGA. That will cover all the detail. You will likely see that then in April. Again, you know, we've talked about this in previous meetings, but I think we truly are in a position where we have to make some, some ultimate decisions here by June about where we're going to go with this. So this is kind of roughly a timeline for that. I do want to talk a little bit about the cost. Now, we're confident, based on what we've seen in the other agreements, that South Metro is eventually going to be asking for a vote for inclusion. So the fire service all within the city limits would be part of the South Metro district. The question is when. So between January 1st, 2019 and that vote for inclusion, what what does that contract look like, that service? How do we pay for that? Even at a vote for inclusion, we'll still have a conversation about the cost. Because, for example, if you do have a vote for inclusion, one of the things that the council could consider is that we do have some property tax, mill levy, that the council could decide they want to dedicate for this purpose. None, all of it, or something in between. So there are ways to perhaps offset some of that cost, even beyond the mill levy, if you wanted to. But at this point in time, I don't have a contract, I don't have a concept, so there is really no way for me to provide any kind of financial analysis today. But we're hoping that there's enough detail in the MOU so that the staff has an opportunity to kind of lay all that out. Now, also, between now and a vote for inclusion, or again, January 1st, 2019, you know, there, we could have some kind of level of a service contract, so how do we pay for that until the vote for inclusion? 
So, you know, we're anticipating there's going to be a higher cost to this. One of the things we're trying to negotiate is whether or not we can step into that until the vote for inclusion. If we can't, then obviously we're going to have to come back to you in the budget process for 2019 at least and talk about, okay, what are your options for that? Now, one of your options could be fund reserve. Now, I say that very cautiously because, in my opinion, the only reserve that you have that's applicable is in the general fund. It is not in the capital fund, in my opinion. I will not recommend to you the use of the capital project fund to offset this cost on the fire. We've talked about this a little bit in detail, and certainly, maybe even at the retreat, we may talk about the financial sustainability of the capital project fund. We have a serious problem there. And for us to spend any reserves for this purpose, I, I will not recommend that. Now, I just want to kind of set the stage, because if you go look at the general fund reserves, we've talked about the use for an emergency. Well, here we are. The challenge with using a reserve in the general fund is that typically you have to come up with a strategy to pay it back. So you may use it, but then how do you pay it back? All this is to say, this is obviously a very complex problem financially, service delivery. And I know there's a lot of questions that circulate out there today, but I don't, can't give you answers today until I start getting draft documents so that we understand the dates and the timing and what that looks like. And so we're hoping that again, the first of March will be the first opportunity and then fine tune that in the months that follow. Yes. So a part of the, the selling this to us going to uh, Southwest was that we were going to save like three to $400,000 uh, by going to them. That was, that was dispatch. Is that dispatch? Well, yeah, we don't have dispatch. any numbers. Or oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah maybe it's also important, thank you for reminding me, maybe it's also important to remember that whatever yeah. our costs were, actually for this year, was in the old partnership, and that is gone. It's nothing more than history, interesting information. There's no relevance to it anymore because there's no way for us to replicate that partnership. It's gone. Yeah, and the statement of selling this to us, um, that, like that doesn't exist either anymore. I mean, we kind of landed of, we don't, I mean, our option, we, we didn't have any more options, or our options were severely limited. Um, and now it's about the diligence of how do we enter into a very strong and beneficial agreement for Little Tin. Um, for fire, so it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a very different conversation. Like the, the 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 terminology, the vocabulary that we have to use now is very different. Mm -hmm. so Correct. This, this might also require going to a vote of the people this year. That's the vote of what I would call the vote for inclusion. So eventually, yeah, our citizens. It, will it have to seemed vote. to me you have to couple it with how the devil we're going to pay for it. Absolutely. I mean that's that was the part I was meaning. Absolutely, yes. So, you know, the again, there are some interesting options for us. We're different than the, our Highlands Ranch and the Fire District, but it's still a very complex and challenging problem. Financially, this is going to be difficult, um, but there are, there are ways for us to kind of mitigate some of that. Well, I mean, it's a huge, important information piece for citizens, not not a whitewash, not a whatever, but a lot of people will say, well, just reduce all the employee salaries and use that money. But if you do that, you're going to lose all the people that help make the city what it is because we compete with everybody else to get qualified, highly qualified, skilled people. Um, so this is a, an important... Um, it is, and remember that the prior conversations to kind of replicate this level of service from what we have today, or even what South Metro for a standalone, is, is not a practical application in my view. I know we, we shared some preliminary information with that. We're actually kind of reviewing that in more detail, and we'll share that with you as time permits here. But. Um, Really, truly, I think the, you know, the council got focused on probably the best alternative we truly have, 
and that is to try to uh, look at it, South Metro as, the, as an option here to, in large part, replicate the level of service that we've had. I think to Peggy's point, communication, you know, out there as, as much as we can as, as information is coming through. So we start laying the groundwork so people can see, you know, why we made the decision we made and, you know, why, you know. And why this is a positive thing. Yeah, that's, that's correct. Right, right, no question. And I think well, what starts to happen, and we see it, so again, communication comes up, and I would encourage and challenge us that when we have our retreat communication, if, if it hasn't been, you know, lined item, I think it's a conversation we have to have. Um, because even in this case, now it's a whole different scenario, a whole different situation than what was happening in development for Columbine or the fire that happened in Columbine. But here again, communication surfaces as an important element. I think um, going back to the previous discussion about Columbine Square, we can use that process of laying out a timeline from the city to say, you know, have a hot button issue on our website that then we'll go to Columbine Square slash fire and say, here's the timeline for what people are saying. Why are, why are we doing this? Well, you know, why is it taking it until 2019? Well, here's the timeline. Here's the numbers. Here's, you know, we can even say about the history of that's what happened with the partnership program. I think that's a good process. It's not just timeline, but what has to be, right. it's like a decision point thing, only to put that on the website it gets a little complicated, but have to do this, these are the order, these are the things we have to do in this order to, to address That sounds like a timeline. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not yes, I get, I get your point. We have that information that is yeah. relevant and important for the And community. it helps us, right? So yes. the more we can communicate up front, so you know, the time we're putting up in front, we're gaining tenfold of that, right? Because That's we right. can get down this path and it'll just blow up on us. And so we have to do this upfront work. It's important. And I think that, that it's also key because this is a primary service of this, mm -hmm. of what we do. And I think that we need to be very clear as to the process that we're going through in order to, for the community to understand there's not going to be a gap in service, there's not going to be a loss of service, that this is going to be a continuous and that this whole process is moving. Be a that is service. Service. Yeah. And that this process is moving now. in that fashion. And so what we can share, we obviously will share, I think the communications department has um, their work cut out for them at this point. Um, of course, it is a negotiation, so there will be some things that we can't, but the fact that we are negotiating, the fact that we are in conversation, I think then people will know that things are moving. So obviously you've heard that it's it's a top priority. I think it's important to let people know that there is a negotiation, it's not a done deal. It's not a done deal. People think it's, you know, this is what's happening. Yeah, there are conversations, so. <clears throat> All right, Council. You know, I'll just make another plug to priority-based budgeting. What perfect timing for priority-based budgeting to come to fruition yes. because that's, this is exactly um, where, where that helps us to identify and recognize this is a port, you know, this is the first quartile and it's important and what's it, what do we need to invest in to make this the, important, the service that we expect? Thank you. Yes. Mark, Mark, where'd you be? <laughs> Maybe just at the uh, next day session, just uh, give us an update on dispatch and how that's all working uh, and all. I'd be happy to. Yeah, yeah, so I know. Uh, yeah. Perfect. All right. That's Anything it. else? All right. Can you urge